Good afternoon. Genome editing is like a GPS navigation. It really is a great tool to lead us quickly where we're heading to. And in this case, it, is, it brings us to the changes in crops that are beneficial for the society. Ladies and gentlemen, cordially welcome to Prague and especially to this conference on genome editing for food safety and crop improvement. I also warmly greet those watching us here in the Aldas Hotel online. My name is Eliška Zvolánková and it is a great honor for me to guide you through the two conferences days. We are also very pleased to have so many esteemed speakers and guests. This conference is organized by the Czech Academy of Sciences together with the EU SAGE as a part of the Czech president, EU presidency. Let us start with the introductory video. Jsme pány země koule, že jsme jako společnost, ať už na východě nebo na západě, velmi zranitelní. Cokoliv se stane na jednom konci země koule, dřív nebo později, již dopadne vlastně na země koule celou. A to byly věci, na které jsme doteď nebyli zvyklí. Ty světové války ukázaly tu možnost dopadu globálního, ale myslím si, že si pořád lidstvo na celém světě nepřipouštělo to, jak rychle se může rozšířit například nějaká infekce, jako v případě koronaviru. Prioritou českého předsednictví by mělo být téma společenské odolnosti, tedy principů, díky kterým společnost dokáže úspěšně čelit krizím, nečekaným událostem nebo radikálním změnám podmínek. Budování odolné společnosti je právě to připravovat se v dobrých časech na to, co přijde, když jde do tuhého, když se něco děje, nějaká krize. My jsme zažili energetickou krizi, koronavirou krizi, teď bohužel i krizi s válečným konfliktem. Odolná společnost se primárně neřídí kulturou strachu. To znamená, že není ani bezvládná, jak si odevzdaná osudu, ale není ani urputně bránící se jakékoliv změně. Ideální odolná společnost je taková, která má prostředky technické i kapacity, a nějaké institucionální uspořádání znalosti. Když mluvíme o zdrojích, které vyživují odolnou společnost, tak je to bez pochyby důvěryhodnost lídrů, ať už politických nebo těch, kteří stojí v čele institucí a organizací. Úkolem celé vědecké komunity by mělo být uh, ujednotit, se, ujednotit se na konkrétních stanoviscích a ty pak dávat k dispozici uh, vládám na celém světě. Druhým takovým principem je etická kultura ve veřejné zprávě, ale i v biznise. Třetím takovým aspektem je etika péče nebo pečo, pečování vlastně o slabší články společnosti právě proto, že společnost je tak silná, jak je silný její nejslabší článek. Jsem přesvědčená o tom, že geneticky modifikované plodiny, hospodářské plodiny, které jsou připravené cílenou metodou genomového editování, jsou bezpečné a současně jsou naší nadějí pro to, abychom měli dostatek potravin v budoucnosti. Hrozící nedostatek potravin je nutné řešit, protože jejich nedostatek bude logicky znamenat navyšování ceny a snížení dostupnosti potravin pro většinovou společnost, to znamená ohrožení jejich zdravé výživy. No a v takovém tom kritičtějším rozsahu, v tom závaznějším rozsahu může znamenat um, um, politické krize, um, lokální nestability a migraci. Podle nás jediná možná cesta je, jsou právě ty genetické modifikace, protože strašně zrychlují proces šlechtění a jsou především cílené a kontrolovatelné. Dnes máme k dispozici metodu CRISPR, stručně zkracované jako CRISPR, CRISPR-Cas, která není založena na tom, že vkládáme do děčné informace cizí DNA, ale že tu DNA modifikujeme, že přepisujeme pořadí písmenek dědičného kódu. Je to metoda velice rychlá, velice přesná, velice efektivní a do určité míry levná. Ty rostlinné linie, které jsou produkty genové editace, tak vlastně jsou takové, které by mohly vzniknout i spontánní mutací. A to je to, proč my si myslíme, že geneticky editované rostliny, zejména ty, kde nedochází ke vnášení cizí genetické informace, by neměly být, by s nimi nemělo být zacházeno jako s GMO plodinami. Evropa se dostává do stále většího spoždění za vyspělým světem a toto spoždění budeme velmi obtížně dohánět. Já 
jádro jako jediný zdroj nám umožňuje vyrábět elektrickou energii bez závislosti na denní době, klimatických podmínkách a nebo roční době. To nám také umožňuje výrazně zvýšit naši energetickou bezpečnost. U jaderných elektráren jsou největší ty prvopočáteční investice, ale ten provoz sám je levný a my za to dostáváme stabilní zdroj elektřiny, navíc získaný vlastně z velmi kompaktního zdroje, kterým se můžeme dobře zásobit dopředu. Hlavní výhodou jedné energetiky je to, že při výrobě neprodukuje skleníkové plyny, včetně CO2. Navíc produkuje poměrně malé množství odpadu. Pokud to myslíme vážně s ochranou klimatu proti řekněme, skleníkovým plynům, tak je zapotřebí, aby byla celosvětově jedná energetika prosazována. Kombinace obnovitelných jaderných zdrojů je jedinou prokázanou cestou, jak lze dosáhnout nízkoemisní energetiky a tím účinně bojovat proti klimatickým změnám. Úkol vědy v krizových obdobích je úplně klíčový, protože věda by měla být schopná na pomoci rozlišovat faktické informace od těch míst nejistoty. Si uvědomujeme, že je potřeba pro evropskou společnost zajistit nejenom dostatečné množství bezpečných potravin, ale také dostatečné množství bezpečné energie a to vše vlastně společnosti, která bude sebevědomá a v ideálním případě odolná vůči působení vnějších vlivů. Já bych si přála, aby se Česká republika představila jako kultivovaná země, slušným způsobem rozvinutá a která právě nenaslouchá tolik fake news a dá na doporučení odborníků, ať už je to jakýkoliv obor. Those were the three priorities of the Czech Academy of Sciences. You will see some of the speakers from the video on the stage. And as the first one, I would like to ask the president of the Czech Academy of Sciences, Professor Eva Zajimalova, to open the conference. Thank you very much. I didn't know that they will show this, so I am a little bit embarrassed. <laughs> Dear members of European Parliament, Madame Šojdrová, Madame Vrecionová, I am saying this in alphabetical order. Uh, dear Professor Inze, dear distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's really a pleasure for me to be able to welcome you on behalf of the Czech Academy of Sciences at this conference. And it could be also vice versa, conference on genome editing for crop improvement and food safety. It, it only depends on the logic we use. Uh, I'm also very glad that it is hosted here in Prague by the Czech Academy of Sciences and in very close collaboration with our partners from European Sustainable Agriculture through Genome Editing Network, so-called EU SAGE. And I must say here that uh, we were considering organizing such a conference during Czech presidency, but the last, let's say, encouragement came from Professor Inza, so thank you, Dirk. Uh, I think that now nobody has any doubts um, that ensuring sustainability of food production is one of the basic conditions and prerequisites for the survival of mankind. It sounds great. Uh, but it is not only in connection with rising consumption, consumption due to the growth of human population, but also in context of climatic change and also in context of some war conflicts like now war at Ukraine. And I think that all these uh, challenges uh, for more sustainable and climate resilient agriculture are needed not only in Europe. Uh, new genomic techniques uh, that are quickly, quickly developing uh, in plant breeding have the potential to help to increase the profitability of EU agricultural sector without too much harming the environment. And uh, unfortunately, relevant European legislation in contrast to many other parts of the world is now very strictly limiting factor in this. And I am proud to say that actually 
uh, this, these problems were touched by my colleagues uh, from the Czech Republic several times. And in fact, one of the such examples is one of the first publications on the given topic that was entitled Genome Editing, Scientific Opportunities, Public Interests and Policy Options in the EU, which was prepared by the European Academy Science Advisory Council, so-called ESAC, in close co collaboration with my colleagues from, from the Czech Republic, not only them, of course. If you look at the practice, I think it is very much needed to ensure that the regulatory network of new genomic techniques considers not only their expected benefits and possible risks, but also responds to the development of the state-of-the-art research in a sufficiently flexible manner. And this is what we cannot see now, unfortunately. And it must be, the, the research must, must be run in accordance with relevant legal and ethical rules and standardized procedures, because there must be trust between scientists, policymakers, and the public. And to build a trust, there must be public and policymaking engagement. And I think this is the only way that uh, can abroad, uh, that can actually assure or achieve uh, the broad social consensus in this very sensitive area. Uh, and this is also the main purpose of this conference. So, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I wish you a successful conference, many new ideas coming, and a nice stay in our Prague. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. President. We are also very pleased to have here a Czech member of the European Parliament. Please welcome Veronika Vrecionová. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation to today's conference. It's a great pleasure for me to speak here at the beginning and say a few words. First, let me say a few numbers. In 1960, there were 0.4 hectares of agricultural land for every inhabitant of the planet. 60 years later, it's roughly half, 0.2 hectares. While the planet's population has increased from three nearly uh, 8 billion, the area of agricultural land has only expanded by about 8%. At the same time, there are fewer people on the planet with insufficient food intake than in past. These figures are initially indeed to show the enormous progress that agriculture has undergone in past decades. Recently, we have been forgetting the main task of agriculture which is the production of enough food to feed the ever-increasing population. Because if we abandon this main task, our people will be the first to feel it. After all, we can see the effects of the lack of certain foods now as a result of Russian aggression in Ukraine. Part of the grain production disappeared, and as a result, its price immediately increased on foreign markets, which caused enormous problems and unrest, especially in the poorest regions. Our ability to produce more and more food in the same area is due to one thing, innovation and science. Improving cultivation method and the use of new technologies, especially the use of pesticides and fertilizers, helps to produce enough food. However, we have reached a state where this activity is not sustainable in some areas and has a number of negative consequences. By increasing the number of synthetic substances, we no longer increase production. On the contrary, we harm nature. In order to limit the use of these substances in agriculture, we must have something to replace them. Farmers use synthetic fertilizers and pesticides to protect plants from diseases and pests and to supply them with nutrients that are no longer in the soil or that 
plants cannot take from the soil. Today's conference is about gene editing, about an innovative breeding method that has the potential to be an alternative solution for agriculture. It can help us maintain or even increase production in situations where we will apply limited use of a pesticide. And not only that, it can help us adapt to climate change. We can breed plants so, they, so that they manage water better. They don't lose it during the dry season. On, on the contrary, they can better absorb it during short but intense rainfall. However, the potential of gene editing is much greater. In August of this year, the Innovative Genomic uh, Institute Research Group in Berkeley announced the launch of a new program aimed at us uh, at using the CRISPR method to edit plant gen uh, genes to increase their ability to store carbon. A greater number of plants capable to absorbing carbon dioxide from atmosphere can contribute to a redu reduction of high temperat uh, temperatures and therefore slow down climate change. Science helps us again. However, as many times in the past, our biggest barrier is fear and excessive caution. In the military field, innovations are put into practice almost immediately, and no one addresses what potential harm can be done with them, because they benefit in terms of defense greatly exceeded these negatives. On the other hand, abroad there is a technology in gene editing that has proven for years to help and which has not yet shown any major side effects, and we are still waiting. The precautionary rule doesn't just hold us back, it basically stopped us. In the European Parliament's Agriculture Committee, we have been applying to the Commission for several years to speed up the creation of new legislation specifically in, intended for the gene editing. European legislation is our big obstacle. I understand the fear of the uncontrolled use of gene genetically modified organisms. I understand the fear, although I don't think it's rational. However, I absolutely do not understand what is the basis on which the European Commission is guided in the field of gene editing. Already in 2021, the European Commission presented a study on new breeding techniques and concluded that the current legislation is bad. It's the end of 2022 and nothing has changed. A public consultation took place from April to July this year, in which 80% of respondents stated that the current leg legislation is insufficient. Only in the second quarter of 2023, the Commission will present an impact assessment followed by a proposal for new legislation. This slow pace, in my opinion, fulfills all the criticism that has appeared against the European Union. On the one hand, it pushed for an extreme pace in reducing CO2 emissions, in limiting pesticides and synthetic fertilizers, but at the same time, it's unable to offer farmers an affordable alternative. Nowadays, the domestic education portal Biotrin.cz registers a total of 41 ag agriculture commodities that are already on the market or are being prepared to be launched on the market by all of the mentioned products were created through so-called new breeding techniques. So, so through GRISPR and its variants. In many cases, these are key agriculture commodity, commodities such as bananas, potatoes, barley, cucumbers, tomatoes, rapeseed, grapevines, rice or soya beans. 
animal raw materials such as tilapia fish, but also pigs, are also subject to CRISPR. The most absurd thing about the whole thing is that the bio European producers cannot use this method. Importers can import foods treated in this ways because it is not possible to distinguish them from products obtained by classic, classical breeding. I see several tasks for today's conference. The main one is the dissemination of information, facts and data about use and safety of the innovative technique for agriculture and food production. The second task should be to increase pressure on the European Commission and subsequently on both co-legislators to come up with the final legislative amendments as soon as possible. It's in the interest of farmers, it is in the interest of citizens, and it is also in the interest of our planet. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Bretzionova, for your insight, for your introductory words. And I think that we will cover on this conference the two topics that you mentioned towards the end. So now, last but not least, please welcome Karel Blaha from the Ministry of Environment of the Czech Republic. Madam President, dear Parliament members, Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you good afternoon, and I'm very really happy I can be here at the conference uh, on behalf of the Minister of Environment, who is one of the principal bodies covering the legislation concerning the biotechnologies. I have to, it's my duty, greet this conference on behalf of the Minister Anna Hubachkova who has quite recently resigned for health reasons. She's not technically replaced yet, but she asked me to be here to any possible extent. I hope that time allows me today and tomorrow to stay for the full time. Because she has taken this conference as one of the most important contributions to support the Czech Presidency of the European Union. It has been mentioned already in all contributions, including the introductory video, that the biotechnologies, let me use that general term, are important in many aspects, starting with the food safety and crop improvement, and with the insurance to have food enough for the growing population around the globe, and ending with climate change issues and energy issues, which are currently quite emerging. All of those aspects are perfectly defined, and I believe that the contributions to this conference will give us a clear picture how the world is proceeding. It has been mentioned that the EU seems to be a little bit behind some other parts of the world, and that's true. The story has became well before we became the European uh, Union members, once we got the task to implement the legislation on genetically modified organisms. And we saw since the very beginning that this is too restrictive and prescriptive. Uh, let me just mentioned the name of Professor Drabink, who was one of the pioneers uh, in supporting of using biotechnologies, was helping us to design the Czech Act on Genetically Modified Organisms. And who was the one who has defended all the times uh, the ministry against those people who were screaming in front of my windows, don't believe Blaha, he is lying. He says it's safe. I just have that poster on, on my cabinet in my office because I keep it 
And I'm quite happy to say that this is not happening anymore. So I see some shift in the public understanding. Might not be yet enough, but it's better. But it's not better in thanks to uh, the European Parliament member. If they realize they should push the European Commission to something better, it's great. The presidency, the presidential country has very limited chance to put the pressure to the commission because the mechanism is the collaboration. And the commission is sort of, oh, I have to be a little bit careful on that. I have many friends in the European Commission. But as, as the institution, it is too, too dependent on the current political pressures in, in different EU member states. And the current situation, unfortunately, is not quite favorable to those changes. But we, I can only say we will do our best in that sense. We have a good chance, because one of the biggest tasks for the Ministry of Environment is to uh, coordinate the European Union participation in a big conference of parties uh, on biodiversity. And as a subsequent body, there will be a meeting of parties to help again a protocol on biological safety. And there are many issues and there are many instances on which, especially the risk assessment process, which should be promoted to any possible extent, is the scientific base for that. To improve the legislation, and science to achieve the goals we all wish to. Not to neglect possible risks, because my department is called Department of Environment, the risks, so I have to advocate for the risk assessment in any time. But that must be the real assessment based on scientific results. And I, I have the feeling that many of you uh, can give the clue how to proceed. In more advanced biotechnology, this is the genome editing. Well, I, I don't want to set up any scale, but what's, what's more advanced, what's less advanced, all biotechnologies are very prospective. All of them may have environmental risks, and that's the task of the body which we have um, laid down in our legislation, which is the a Czech Commission for GMOs, consisting of scientists across the country. Some of you might be present in France, they, they have the bad side to the back, but there might be some members of that body. All of our decisions are based on the recommendations of that uh, committee. So in conclusion, I would say that the Ministry of Environment until now has done quite a good deal of work in that area together, of course, with the Minister of Agriculture, who, by the way, organizes this a little bit, unfortunately, in my eyes. It's almost parallel to the conference on the food safety, which is very closely related, and it, it happens tomorrow. I have the advantage that my deputy will go there and I'll get the full report of the video outcome of the conference. Otherwise, thank you again, all of you, EUSH, Czech Academy of Sciences, for, for this event, which helps us, hopefully, to get prepared for December's meeting on biodiversity and biosafety in, in Montreal, Canada. And I wish you good exchange of views. And I, self, I wish myself to be able to stay here to the end. For the Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Blaha. I'm going to repeat myself from the beginning with the genome editing is like a GPS, because I think it is kind of a catchy phrase, isn't it? 
and it's not mine, obviously. I borrowed it. <laughs> but I really like this illustration of what a game changer genome editing or NGTs could be. The author of this phrase is here, too, and he has much more to add to this topic. So please, ladies and gentlemen, here comes the keynote speaker, Dirk Inze, the coordinator of the EU SAGE network and the science director of the Center for Plant System Biology of the Flanders Institute for Biotechnology. Thank you. Thank you very much for this um, kind words. And uh, dear uh, Professor Zazimalova, um, dear members of the European uh, Parliament, thank you for being uh, present here. Uh, dear member of uh, representative of the ministry, and dear colleagues, uh, scientists, um, dear uh, representatives of the press, which are present like here, dear ladies and gentlemen. I would first like to thank the um, Czech Academy of Science like, uh, to organize this fantastic meeting in an important political moment uh, for Europe. And uh, I think this organization went extremely smooth um, in this beautiful venue. We very much appreciate it. And thank you all your co-workers. Thank also to some members of the uh, EUSH, like, which helped uh, but, uh, in this setting this up. Uh, so it's, um, it's for me uh, like also a big honor to, um, to deliver this keynote um, because I think, um, particularly in a country which uh, over time also contributed a lot actually to modern plant breeding and is still very active in this field with uh, excellent uh, plant science which is going on. So thank you very much. So and if I can have the, the first slide, and I can, um, well the second slide I should say, uh, I had the clicker with here, sorry, that's good, yes, that's easier. So I would like to remind you that everything what we eat, um, almost everything what we eat, does not occur in nature anymore. Everything what we eat is actually the result uh, from plant uh, breeding. And there's not something like cauliflower uh, or Brussels sprouts, which occurs uh, like in nature. Not something like the modern maize, you don't find, you find a small plant in Mexico, Teosinte, which is actually, um, well, you would not eat, I would say, like at hard, very hard seeds. And like it's by breeding that you get this massive uh, seed producing plant machinery. You don't find uh, watermelon, you don't find bananas, carrots, and so on, and so on, and so on. And so, on. so one should not forget all that, that really plant breeding uh, uh, contributed uh, like enormously to our daily life, uh, to, and it's already been settled to maintaining actually and improving the life quality of billions of people on this planet, on less land and uh, with a greater food and safety. So many, many traits like in plant breeding rely on, uh, on single uh, genes, I think. And I just uh, take this opportunity really to honor actually uh, where it all started like here in Brno uh, with uh, Gregory Mendel and with this uh, seven genes like he identified, which were all um, monogenic traits which were uh, allowed him to um, formulate the Mendelian laws and the um, So, and uh, in fact, this helped like enormously a uh, breeding process. I mean, actually many of the genes which contributed uh, like to, um, to really a better uh, quality and of food, uh, like a higher productivity, are dictated by simple uh, genes. We know these genes, by the way, we have we have been learned over the last 40 years enormously uh, how plant genes work. In fact, uh, we have the coordinates I mean, for our GPS. And like in fact, we know what tool chains to have uh, certain traits. And like, for example, um, the early uh, maize lines, they had many stalks. Uh, like you can see many leaves. Uh, like and with a single gene that's called uh, the gene called Teosinte branched, you can convert uh, this from a multi stock um, uh, uh, trait to a single stock, and that contributed enormously to productivity. And the man here, the Sham, is uh, Norman Borlaug, which also actually, in very difficult times, nobody believed in this research in the early days. And like in fact, like in very difficult times, was actually breeding for shorter uh, wheat varieties, disease-resistant wheat varieties, which uh, was, was in the future um, a later called the gene by the Green Revolution, which I think saved a co I mean, more or less half a billion of people on this planet from starvation because this 
new wheat varieties, they were resistant uh, to wind, uh, they had a higher productivity compared to the older uh, varieties. So, but it's not always that simple. Actually, many uh, traits are um, not dictated by single genes, but are dictated by multiple uh, genes. We call that polygenic, uh, in fact. Also, the traits are, are very much influenced by the environment. They are influenced by the genetic background. That means that it all, not always these genes have the same effect uh, like in every variety. Also, that's an and so, and uh, many of these um, polygenic traits, like in fact, dictate like um, traits like yield, uh, grain weight, uh, tolerance to drought, and like in fact. And here, breeding has a much uh, bigger uh, like problem. You have to stack uh, many small effect on the genes uh, to have uh, like a certain uh, effect. Uh, that's the reason why breeding uh, like makes uh, progress, but uh, really suffering, uh, for example, to generate drought or tolerance uh, like, uh, in. In a, in a faster and a faster way. I have to remind you also that breeding, the classical breeding, in fact, uh, relies on mutations. Mutations that occur spontaneously, and that's, um, you can find that in, in, in gardens occasionally, for example, here, that you see a petal which is white because there is a mutation occurred actually in one of the genes which is involved in, like, in color formation or in this uh, flower here, like where there's two flowers and a few. So this kind of mutation, and then in our crops, like which were sometimes have, are beneficial and can contribute to a certain uh, trait. So these are happening by chance, eh, by coincidence, like in fact, like and, and breeders are looking for this kind of changes, like which have uh, contribute to an improved uh, character of the plant. We have learned actually in the past like, uh, century to improve the or to increase the rate of this mutation. Without mutation, you have no change, like in fact. And the way to, to do that either was by using chemicals and or by using irradiation. And that sounds already pretty dangerous, I would say, like uh, for many people. But that's the way it has been done, like in fact. But don't forget all this, uh, you can increase the mutation rate, so the changes in the genome, but all these changes are non targeted. This technology, in fact, is being massively being used uh, to create uh, new varieties. Uh, like, and there is a database uh, here you see the reference, uh, like, and where there are more than 3,200 uh, variants, uh, like which we actually daily eat. Uh, like, in fact, they are on your plate. Uh, like, in fact, which are derived uh, like for from this kind of breeding uh, like technology. Uh, like, and, um, and uh, so you can, uh, including many crops in here, for example, in this uh, oranges uh, like without seeds, uh, like, but there are also many more uh, like ornamental trees uh, like, and so on. Uh, like, and this is still uh, being used uh, like actually massively in uh, plant breeding by uh, technologies called uh, tilling technology, where what actually is doing, if you know actually the GPS, if you know the coordinates of a certain gene, but what you're doing, you're actually going to actually use this m mutagens, this uh, irradiation or this uh, chemicals, to, uh, to create as many as possible mutations. And then with certain technologies, you can actually look whether there by chance there is something changed uh, like in the gene that you want to, uh, to see changed. In the world, this you can, we can look specifically for that. And so this has uh, been used as a really an, a random process. You increase the frequency to find something interesting, but it's still extremely labor intensive uh, to find the mutation that you want, particularly if the trait is de determined by multiple genes, by polygenic uh, traits, uh, again, because then you have to find mutations uh, in multiple copies. Uh, again, so it's a little bit simple, but that's um, so this conventional breeding, so all what I talked to uh, so far is, is what you call conventional breeding. So random mutation, non-targeted, and we can increase this mutation frequency by certain tricks. But then actually, uh, I have to say that this is a time requiring process. <coughs> Seven years is really very fast. It's m most of the time 15, 20 years. In the case of, of phytophthora resistant potato, it took more than 50 years to have certain varieties now which you actually are good for uh, making soup, but uh, not really making good for uh, French, I should call Belgian fries. Uh, like, but, uh, like, and, um, and, and, uh, but um, so this technology is because it's not targeted, it's based upon coincidence, it's searching like a needle in a haystack. And it's not applicable for many plants. For example, grapes, you cannot start breeding with a grape because 
you lose actually the variety. I mean, the, the, the grape Pinot Noir, like, and, and you have fantastic grape varieties here in the Czech Republic. I mean, if you start to breed with it, it becomes something else. Like, and, uh, trees is very difficult. Often you cannot separate positive and negative uh, 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 traits. Like, so if you, your, your gene that you want to change is sometimes so closely linked to, to a neighbor, which, for example, reduces uh, the yield like, of these plants. And it requires a vast, inv uh, requires a vast investment in despite the use of some molecular techniques which have been uh, developed. There is already mentioned uh, like by, uh, by the, my previous uh, speaker, there's also something like genetic modification, GMOs, uh, like in fact where um, from the 80s uh, like technology was developed to insert novel traits uh, like into plants and uh, novel traits very often coming from bacteria and um, there, as you all know, I think the EU took the position, oh, this is novel technology, we don't know actually what is going to happen, like in fact, and there was this moratorium installed like in, uh, since that period, which still actually like, is in place. And again, well, just to give you a world perspective, um, in fact, uh, the whole world is thinking differently about all that, and again, all the countries here in green actually uh, apply at a very, very large scale like GMOs, like in fact, particularly for herbicide and for insect resistance. And in total, in fact, since the last uh, 20, 25 years, 2.7 billion hectares have been grown, so cumulative, eh, that's cumulative, uh, grown worldwide, and um, there has never been any scientific proven effect on human or on animal health. So where is the danger, actually, with some people proclaim uh, that, that there, is, there is nothing to be there? To give you an idea what is 2.7 billion hectares, uh, I looked it up this morning, the size of the Czech Republic is 4 uh, million hectares. So we're talking about the scale which is uh, the entire country, don't talk about uh, uh, agricultural land like here. To already settle, Europe uses the precaution principle, but massively import GMO seeds from the US and Brazil, and we are in part, and uh, we should say it loud, responsible for the deforestation actually in the uh, Brasilia uh, because we import uh, like a huge amount of uh, soybean and particularly uh, from areas uh, like which are on, uh, which are really newly uh, taking into uh, cultivation uh, again. So it's really a problem of that uh, to do so. Fortunately, we have now gene editing. It's an, um, the CRISPR-Cas uh, like and and there, if it, for most of the applications like of genome editing, we'll not go into detail, but 99% of all what is published now, well, like there is no foreign DNA like in any of the genes. It uses the genetic information, like classical breeding, in, in a much more directed like way. So this uh, other speaker will actually, sorry, um, will actually discuss about it, but already been said that it's very efficient, it's very precise, you can make targeted changes, it's your GPS, now you have a machinery, to actually to bring the, the, the changes to the, to the place you want. It's cheap and easy, and the improved varieties cannot be distinguished from varieties obtained by conventional breeding. If nobody tells you in advance that it has been obtained by genome editing, you will not be able to tell that it is obtained in this way. So it's very important, also very important for the legislator, because you cannot check like it's actually that uh, something is produced by that. And as, as such, it's very largely different uh, from GMO. So um, this technology was for the first time published in uh, 2012 uh, and uh, by um, and two ladies, in fact, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna, they already eight years later, which is extremely fast for the Nobel Committee, uh, like in fact, it normally takes a couple of decades before somebody gets a Nobel Prize after the discovery, but very fast after that, they got the Nobel Prize because the enormous impact the technology has both for uh, human medicine and during genetic diseases, for example, and as well as uh, for plant improvement. So it's a revolutionary technique um, because it's much more fast, it's very precise, like here, and, get, um, and I already said, that, like, and, uh, I find the comparison with the GPS actually very good like, because it, um, um, in, in, in the city, which is uh, rather complex, like here, like uh, Prague, like, to find the street, like, with, with, particularly when you're driving a car with a map, would take you quite some time, but fortunately we have uh, GPS technology, and that's very, very comparable. With uh, this genome editing, we bring the, the changes to the place where we have to be. It's like, um, you can also compare it, like in, if you read a book, like in, 
if you have written a manuscript, a, a thesis, or whatever, and you want to change a word, you have to uh, look for actually uh, in the word program and uh, can look uh, for uh, change the word and just one click and it's changed all over the book. Uh, the old-fashioned way was to read the book again. And, um, so this is um, actually this this is really uh, shows the importance of this technology. Unfortunately, and I must say that was uh, totally unexpected. In fact, uh, the European Court of Justice ruled on uh, legal, I guess, on uh, legal grounds. Uh, like I cannot judge all this, but using a completely outdated legislation that CRISPR crops with uh, or GMOs, which in fact de facto actually forbids uh, like it to be used uh, like or to be grown, uh, like in fact, uh, like in Europe, and creates all kinds of problems. And this is absolutely not based upon science. I hope that I have been able to convince you like, about all that, and uh, later other speakers will certainly elaborate on, like, on it. And like, and it's, um, it was not understood like, by the scientific community like, at all. And this raised enormous uh, concern. Like, this is an, really is a missed like, opportunity for, um, for the welfare of the Euro Europeans that we have now we at least already will be five years, we hope, uh, that we have lost, uh, like in fact, uh, that we cannot apply this technology uh, like we should uh, do. And it can. was really um, interesting to see, uh, like in fact, that as soon as the uh, UK left the European Union, one of the first things they did uh, was to talk about changing the legislation uh, like on gene editing. And to the extent now that they cannot use at least uh, like it for field trials, so to be able to move all the scientific results faster into the field. Why do we need um, uh, gene, uh, gene editing? Well, first of all, we need to remain uh, competitive with the rest of the world. This map will be discussed later by other speakers I've seen. Uh, like, and, uh, well, the world is uh, progressing very fast like, with genome editing, and uh, many countries have already legislation uh, like, in place. Uh, countries which were traditionally against uh, GMOs, like Japan, was very much against uh, like, it. With about the first, actually, to introduce uh, genome editing tomato on the market, like in fact, like, and it's actually you can buy it very successfully. People like it, and like, and um, so the not, not only tomato, but apparently also fish already. Like it's quite amazing to see that, and and as you will hear uh, later, there are numerous, really numerous crisp crops, and like in, uh, crisp crops, and like in development. Uh, but uh, other people will um, talk about that later. Already said by the, the member of the, the European Parliament, um, uh, why do we need this technology? Because uh, uh, our food security faces enormous challenges, and we still, uh, everybody expects that there will um, an, an rapidly increase, still an increase in our population from 7.9 uh, 7 billion more or less that we are now to 9.8 billion in um, 25 years. Actually, nothing like it. That's, um, Huge uh, challenge to feed this uh, population, and I can. Um, furthermore, I can, and I think it's a very good thing. Like we see that there is increasing uh, increased uh, standard of living, so people want to have higher quality food, and like they, um, so that puts uh, further pressure uh, like on our food production and our systems. And um, we also, I must say that uh, if you look to the map where this increase in population will happen, it's um, uh, going mainly to happen actually in uh, Africa, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa, Central Africa, Madagascar, Iran. And um, this, um, one of the reasons uh, like, is, uh, like, is that, uh, and that's quite unfortunately, that also for the GMO technology, um, Africa is very often follows uh, the EU legislation. And so that runs parallel. And in fact, uh, like this, this genome editing le legislation could really very much help uh, like what's going on in Africa, not only um, biotechnology, but also even a little bit of fertilizers would help already a lot. Uh, like, but you know, I, I think it's really important to consider that, that we have a responsibility as a European Union also for what's happening in other parts of the world. Because I think most of you will agree that when you increase actually agricultural production locally, this goes hand in hand with a higher living standard, and like in fact, with the fact that you can send your kids to school, and like in fact, and, like and, and that and that actually will uh, slow down the increase and like in population like growth. And certainly with Europe, um, uh, with uh, this enormous uh, projected gr uh, growth in population, Europe has a potential uh, a challenge like in, in front of us. 
don't have to say this here in this country. Um, also, geopolitical threats uh, are really uh, very much on the table now. Well, again, you see here the, the wheat uh, export in 2020. Uh, like that's, of course, now totally different. Uh, but you see the position of Russia uh, like here, um, position of uh, Ukraine, uh, which now restarted to some extent. Uh, like in fact, but it's in extremely important, I think, that we make our European agriculture less dependent on the import from outside the EU. And we have to really to produce, because we have seen it also in former food crisis in uh, 2008, for example, uh, then as uh, soon as there is a shortage, people, uh, countries close their doors, and like, uh, everybody uh, really think about this whole population. We have seen what's happening in, uh, with the food crisis in, uh, in 2008. And there is no wheat anymore in Egypt and in the Middle East, and then you get uh, riots, and like, uh, this Arabic spring, like it's called, and, like here, was not really a spring, it was actually bleeding, people starving. And, like, in fact, uh, like, and, but that's, uh, yeah, we really have to consider all uh, this. And, uh, so we have to develop high performing crops, and again, uh, in Europe. And this is certainly possible. I mean, breeding is, uh, can achieve uh, enormous goals. I uh, mean, that's the most extreme example like, here where, in fact, you see the yield increase like, in corn, this uh, US uh, data that uh, I've collected like, here. Like, you can see that it remains flat until 1940, and the yellow there, and then you see this enormous increase, which is, is technology, is breeding, is plant density, is GMO technology. But there's a seven-fold increase uh, of yield per hectare, is, um, which is an incredible action to see what, uh, how plant breeding contributes to really keeping up uh, with the growing demand uh, in the world, but actually not using that much more land than they used to in 1940. There's also an important uh, challenge uh, here uh, for um, balancing the productivity with the environmental pro uh, protection, less uh, pesticides less uh, fertilizer. We all want all that, I think, uh, like it's uh, uh, good for the environment, and that's also in agreement with the far, uh, farm to fork strategy uh, for a fair, healthy, environmental, friendly food system. But we have to give farmers the tools, actually, to do that by forbidding the use of, of pesticides. I mean, you, you give, really put an enormous pressure uh, on these farmers because uh, the, these pests uh, continue to grow well again. And of course, we should not replace the synthetic pesticides by the so organic, so-called organic pesticides like copper sulfate, which are actually also very toxic for the environment. So, making plants resistant to diseases is the way forward to go. Like, and this should, goes hand in hand like, with with uh, with what actually this uh, uh, more part to fork strategy uh, goes uh, on. Like, in fact. So this enhances the. the Nutrient deficiency of crops is certainly possible and can affect the deeper root systems, better uptake of um, nitrogen and so on. Just give you one example, and you will hear much more about that. There are already very, actually many examples uh, of resistance uh, of, uh, to uh, uh, devastating pathogens. For example, in the heat, uh, in the wheat uh, here, you see the control, you might see the yellow color, there's a rust. If your um, wheat field is infected by, uh, by this, you can you see an enormous drop uh, in productivity. But well, you can, by CRISPR, develop actually plants uh, which are completely resistant. And you might say you might uh, might uh, um, do this by classical breeding. Well, in this particular case, there's only one gene responsible for that. It's a susceptibility gene which makes wheat susceptible to the pathogen. But you don't have to forget uh, that wheat is a complex genome. They are uh, we are actually each time six copies of that gene, uh, that, uh, six copies which you have to, to change before you get disease resistant. And this by classical uh, breeding, where you have things happen by coincidence, by chance, it's virtually not possible to achieve. Like by CRISPR, it actually has been achieved uh, like maybe half, uh, half a year actually before you get these plants. So it speeds up the whole thing. Another tomato here, it's also a, a fungal disease. Uh, um, in uh, many, many examples, and you will hear more about it in this meeting. And then maybe uh, the elephant in the room, uh, which is, um, but is slow moving, uh, but is particularly dangerous for the entire society, is of course climate change, uh, where um, this is also directly related uh, with agriculture. I think I uh, just have to remind you that um, this has become worse and worse. This is a map of Europe in August 2022. 
where everything in origin was in the kind of uh, in the drought alert, I mean, so that you had already have a reduced drought productivity, while everything like in red uh, is uh, shown here where we have a severe drought, where actually really that plants start to even down to die. Right? And this becomes worse and worse every, uh, every year. So what can we do? Like, well, we have, of course, the problem like, of uh, CO2 accumulation like, here, but um, also uh, methane, particularly uh, produced uh, by, by ruminants, <coughs> that is a problem because it's 100 times more stronger as a greenhouse gas. And also nitrous oxide, which is even 300 times stronger. Nitrous oxide is actually the result of, of using fertilizers, both organic as well as synthetic uh, uh, fertilizers. But when in the soil, their, their bacteria break it all down. In part, of it has been used on the plant. In part, it leaches like, out to the, to the water. That's the problem with uh, the contamination with nitrogen. But also, part actually is uh, converted into a gas, nitrous oxide, uh, which is also a very strong uh, greenhouse gas. So I think we have a very big responsibility as a plant science community, actually, to, to really to take uh, this challenge and uh, also very serious and can to start to improve our plants so that you really are much more climate resilient but also actually actively contribute to uh, reducing these uh, greenhouse gases. And this is not uh, impossible. One well, of my last uh, slides, uh, in fact, so if you look for example to the CO2 accumulation uh, that happens every year, this is kind of zigzag actually uh, uh, slope. So it increases uh, really quite, uh, quite fast, I would say. But you can see that the zigzag in, into that is because plants uh, every year in, the, in the, the Nordic hemisphere, where there are more plants than in the southern hemisphere, uh, plants start to grow in spring. And they start to take up like CO2 from the air. They incorporate all that, in, for example, in plant material and wood. And it, uh, that continues until deep in the summer, and then as the winter starts, and then it, uh, we start to burn. Then you see the burning of uh, fossil fuels, which again contributes uh, to really the increase in CO2. So plants are very important sources, actually, of um, CO2, CO2 captation. It's a kind of a kind of system which is in one employed at a much more efficient uh, scale by planting more forest, and in fact, uh, can. Uh, and or by making plants which really are much better in capturing the CO2 and that's absolutely impossible to do and then uh, some institutes really now put a lot of money into that. But also the whole process of regenerative agriculture that means putting more carbon in the soil and that's maybe plants with, uh, with larger root systems and better interaction with, uh, with certain fungi, with average fungi and so on. And in fact that could contribute a lot to reducing uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. Methane, um, obviously we have to reduce our uh, meat consumption, consumption, I think that's the only way to do it. Uh, can, that will free up uh, quite some land, maybe to reforest uh, or to rewild. But we can also grow protein crops, uh, and uh, protein, particularly pulses, uh, are very important, uh, which have a amino acid composition which is really favorable or not direct for human uh, consumption. So that's certainly something that uh, will Europe has to invest in more and more and again. And then you yeah, have the problem of nitrous oxide, which is uh, ignored in, uh, in many, many studies, but is really becoming uh, more and more visible. And it is, we need to really improve on the way that plants uh, deal with nitrogen uh, use efficiency. We, we have to make sure that plants actually take up uh, nitrogen better, that there's much uh, less leakage like, into the environment and also less uh, greenhouse uh, gases which are emitted uh, from using these uh, fertilizers. And with this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have some take-home messages. Uh, in fact, is that I think uh, I'm speaking here for a convinced audience, I think that gene editing is an innovative tool for efficient crop breeding. Um, it is really targeted, it's highly precise, and this in, in uh, comparison with the classical conventional methods, uh, can, which are relying on coincidence. It's very different actually from GMOs, uh, low foreign DNA, very important. And I think it's you know, of great importance uh, for the world, for, um, uh, for food security in a rapidly changing world with climate emergence. And there's an urgent need, and that's um, really looking forward to the politicians uh, here, and they have a very important voice into that. An urgent need for an adapted science-based legislation uh, on uh, genome editing. And 
With this, just uh, one concluding um, uh, sentences in the future, good whisper, it would come out for CRISPR. Thank you very much. <laughs>
before we reach more than one or two degrees Celsius increase in temperature, and then the, the, the yield will go down quite dramatically as, as well. So we need new generation of crops that are adapted to climate change, that have higher and, in particular, stable yield. Uh, and and this, is, this is really a great challenge. Now, what we can do, uh, we should still remember that there's an enormous diversity of, of uh, living forms, a great genetic diversity uh, going uh, from the, the species that we have domesticated, so within the crops, but we can also consider crop-wide relatives, so the, the species which were not domesticated, but they are very close to our crops and our species, and we can also go up far away, away from crops to go to other related species. And giving you just one example, the salicornia is, is, is a salt tolerant plant. So uh, we may search for molecular pathways and, and genes and, and, and enzymes that, that give this property to that plant so that our crops will be adapted to adverse uh, conditions uh, uh, in, in different areas of, of the world. And, um, and obviously the, the white relatives are something we should really mind because they were not domesticated and there are many genes which our crops lost simply because we were not interested in those traits and we now are interested. So, so we, should, we should not miss the opportunity to mine this, this treasury, to utilize this treasury. Now, uh, uh, I'd like to go through a few steps where, when this, this, this treasury was used. So starting with palm domestication and the origin of agriculture, um, the, 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 the people who became farmers were simply relying on, on natural diversity. So the natural occurrence of mutations that change the, the, the habit or, or behavior of plants so that it, it, it was beneficial for them. It was obviously not beneficial for wild plants, but that, that obviously was not the interest of the, of the first farmers. And, and um, I will not describe it in details, but just to underline the fact that from the very beginning, and it was mentioned in the previous talk, uh, our crops or the development of the crops which we eat and we need was based on changes on, of genetic information. In this case, the change was spontaneous and, and, and two nice examples are seed chattering in rice where a single change in a single base out of 400 million base pairs of the rice genomes changed the, the shattering and have it to non-shattering. That was very critical. And similar uh, case is the, is the barley, where uh, the brittle rackets obviously is a disadvantaged trade, trade because it's difficult to bring the crop to the, to the house, to the farm. But a uh, single deletion is either one gene, um, one base pair, or a, a short stretch of base pairs change the habit. So this shows that from the very beginning uh, we were relying on changes of genetic information and this genetic inf change was spontaneous. The problem of using this approach is that it, the, 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 these mutations occurred in a very low rate. But they were still useful and continue to be useful until today. And uh, well, nice example is the green revolution already mentioned. To be more specific, um, um, the, the genes or muta mutations of genes that, that, had, that affected plant growth so that the plants were shorter, the, 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 the stems were, sh were shorter. So in wheat it was reduced height gene, um, just by chance the mutant was found and could be used in breeding program, or in rice it was semi-dwarfing gene. Um, um, and, and, and these two successful um, breeding programs are known. Bre wheat was bred in, in International Maize and Wheat Breeding Center in Sydney. And very often we forget about rice that was bred in, in an International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines. So we usually mention Norma Bola, and he deserved that. But there were many other people who did the same in rice. Um, and, and indeed, both the production of wheat and rice in, in India and other Asian countries increased dramatically many times. This was a nice, uh, I would say, nice answer to the book published by, by Paul Ehrlich, uh, American biologist, who predicted that hundreds of millions of people will die of hunger, and this didn't happen. So the science and reading um, 
um, solve the problem of, of, of danger of, of a large scale famine. Now, uh, unfortunately, I have, we, we all should admit that despite the huge success of the Green Revolution, and we should be all grateful to that, uh, obviously it comes at cost. And these crops, these high yielding crops, are high yielding only if we provide enough, if there's available enough moisture, intensive fertilization, the use of herbicides, fungicides, and insecticides. Um, well, this obviously has a negative impact on environment, and again, already mentioned the, the, um, the nitrogen um, um, fertilizers. We produce them industrially, and uh, perhaps it may be surprising for you to know that the production of only the nitrogen fertilizers requires one to two percent of global energy produced by humankind, and the, 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 the production releases three percent of carbon. Only the nitrogen fertilizers. And of course, most of them, most large part of them is lost in the environment and ends up in, in underground waters. Um, yet, there are plants who can fix uh, nitrogen from the air, and this is one of the offers from the nature. Obviously, it's not so easy to do that, but we, sh we should put this as a long-term goal, because that would certainly uh, reduce the requirement for industrial fertilizers, and obviously, nutrient use efficiency as such, and that's a clear goal. And, uh, and we are also using other fertilizers which, which come from non-renewable deposits or resources. So one we end up, uh, it will be difficult to replace them or use something else. Now, um, um, we still have quite a large diversity within the gene pool um, uh, of our crops. But that's obviously limited, because the domestication started with quite a limited number of plants. Yeah. And obviously, during the breeding, we were not interested in traits that were not of interest by the time. And now we need them. What we can do, we can look around. And as I already mentioned, we can go to wild crop relatives. These can be either classified as secondary or tertiary gene pools. The difference is only the difficulty at which they, they can be crossed with our crops so that the genes can be introduced. But it's easy to say, and we, there's a huge interest in using this diversity in breeding improved crops. The problem is how to do that. Um, if, you, if you want to introduce a gene from a wild relative to a, to a crop, you cross it, but you create a hybrid which will not be what you want. So you need to backcross and backcross and backcross and backcross so that you eliminate most of the genome of, of the wild relative and you end up with a gene of interest. This takes time. Well, um, because there's a, such a huge interest in using this resource, uh, and there was a, there's a recently developed technique called speed breeding, which helps us to, to, to have up to maybe six generations in one year. So in weed, you may end up perhaps with three generations per year. You may have up to six generations per year. There's even more serious problem and very difficult to overcome, and this is linkage drag. So that with the gene of interest, you transfer also unwanted genes that may even compromise the yield of the crop. And it's very hard to separate those genes from the gene of interest. And I think that Alex Kachinka will talk about that later in, in, in my talk. Now, uh, um, imagine that uh, like 15 years ago, um, um, the researchers and breeders were facing the situation where there was no chance to transfer the gene, there was no gene uh, of interest that, that could be used, so the only option left was mutation breeding or mutation induction. Um, yeah, um, and uh, yeah, we should also probably, um, we may criticize this approach in a way because it's a brute force approach. You, you just destroy the genome, you, you, it's difficult to control, it's not targeted, it's not very efficient. But anyway, it was successful, um, at least in a way. And uh, we are in Czech Republic, so allow me to mention one of our breeders, um, Josef Boma, Mr. Josef Boma, uh, who developed molting barley, very famous molting barley um, variety, di diamond, or diamond if you want, um, with shorter stalk, lodging resistance, and increase yield. And, and this uh, cultivar was then used to, to breed a, a, another generation of improved barley cultivars. So we should not abandon this approach, but we should realize the limitations. Um, it's not targeted, um, low efficiency. And uh, um, we already heard about the number of, of, of cultivars that were obtained using these crops. 
So now, uh, so let's move uh, to the to the present time where we are now. So uh, we are facing the problem of produce crops that are climate resilient, they are adapted to climate change, high yield stability, and so on. We do have the resources offered by Mother Nature. That's a huge diversity of genes, etc., etc. On the top of it, we have the genome sequences. So we know where the genes are, either in crops or white relatives. Um, we know the genes. We can clone them. We can isolate them. We, we can we can characterize them. Uh, so. Um, uh, what will be missing is, is a technology to introduce them to our crops, and the technology is here. So in principle, we are ready. And, and many people talk about next green revolution, which we'll use, or which already started, depending on what you, what you believe. Um, uh, that will be based on novel breeding techniques that should finally, um, finally reach the goal of producing crops that we like to have, climate resilient, environment friendly, stable yields, and many other beneficial traits for, for human, human health, for instance. And um, yeah, um, um, one of them is a direct gene transfer, direct gene transfer using Agrobacterium tumefaciens. We all know it's not well received by the public, but it's not really a rational position because this is a natural system that was developed by nature, not that, not by uh, some dirty uh, technicians, um, and 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 the the, uh, the, uh, the 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 bacterium evolved a system to introduce to transfer part of its DNA into into the plant cell, and there was a nice publication showing how many species, even crops, do have insertions of agrobacterium DNA, which were not obtained or developed by human. That, that's just a natural natural system. We all know about horizontal gene transfer. That's part of the evolution, part of the evolution of the, of the plant genomes and not only plant genomes. So, so um, it's pretty, it's not well received, um, but um, luckily, as we already know and we already had, um, we have finally another system that, that may avoid the criticism, and this is the genome editing or CRISPR-Cas technique, and Professor Pechinka will talk more about it in detail, so my, my aim was to provide a more general overview, what we can use from the natural resources and how we can, uh, we can, we can utilize um, this, this diversity, so I will not describe it in, in more detail. It is important that Finally, we have all components of the system. We have the genes, we have the diversity, we know which genes we would like to introduce to our crops, and we have a system to introduce it. Um, I should be a little bit careful and tell you that, of course, we don't know all genes we would like to have. We already heard about quantitative traits, so it's not that easy. But that's just the motivation for people working in genomics, to, to clone more genes, to understand better the genome functions so that we can transfer gene networks, um, regulatory networks, etc., etc. That's a question of time before we will understand this, and we may introduce this system into the uh, plants of interest. I'm not sure if it makes sense here um, to, to provide the examples, so maybe I will not read uh, um, the examples. I will just say that uh, thanks to uh, usage, uh, we have a beautiful database uh, listing the applications of CRISPR, there's more than 500 applications. Unbelievable, if you imagine the short time the technique has been used. So that, that's just wonderful, and I will not give all those examples. You will find everything, and you probably know it, resistance to pathogens, uh, resistance to, to abiotic stress, um, and the quality traits, etc., 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 etc. What I like very much might be we that may be better tolerated by people suffering from intolerance to gluten, etc., 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 etc. So, um, so imagine that um, um, what we are doing is we are trying to improve current crops, but in a way these are artificial creatures that may miss many important traits. So. Why we don't go back to the wild species from where, from which our crops originated and just modify them? The modification that happened uh, during the domestication is sometimes called um, domestication syndrome. And most of the genes that are responsible for the difference between wild species and crops are known. 
So isn't it better to, to go to the wild species and modify them to, to perform the domestication again, but thanks to this technology in a very short time. Again, there were a few wonderful papers showing that this is in this a realistic scenario, and one of them was a nice paper on domestication of tomato, and again, I will not go through the details. Um, only five genes were modified or edited to obtain the tomato, which is uh, undistinguishable almost from, from the cultivated So the conclusions are how I, I like to, uh, to close my, my, my presentation. If you want to achieve food security in a sustainable ma manner, which means less fungicides, less herbicides, uh, less, less uh, fertilizers, we need to develop a new generation of agriculture crops. Uh, obviously, we also may talk about the, um, the, the, the farming system, we may talk about um, uh, reducing uh, food waste, etc., etc., but without a new generation of agriculture crops, considering the current conditions, we will not succeed. Uh, the modification will require the, the the modification will be on an extent that is comparable comparable to the domestication. We really want to, to have a different crop. We, we want to have crops which have completely new and different properties. Um, but we don't have thousands of years of domestication. We have only tens of years maximum to, to rapidly develop such crops. And but thanks to the diversity of genes, to, 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 to what everything the nature is offering to us, and thanks to the, 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 the editing, which is again, has been developed by nature, the, the immune system, uh, this is what the CRISPR-Cas CRISPR -Cas is, um, for precise editing, we have all tools ready and available, and as the experience from other countries shows, it works. So let's hope uh, we can do the same in Europe. And each other probably. Thank you very much for your attention. So now it's your time to ask the questions if you have any. Anybody? Maybe I will have a question for you. <laughs> oh, well, it will be a very short question. Um, what is the difference between the classical or like natural breeding and the new methods in terms of time? Because you talked about it would be much shorter. Well, uh, this is not uh, probably a good question because in a, in a, in a <laughs> traditional breeding, you make an incremental step. You know, so uh, the breeding of a new cultivar may take ten years, for instance. But you increase the yield by one or two percent. You know, the breeders are happy if they have, if the new cultivar has. I hope there are no breeders, uh, but uh, <laughs> but uh, it's like that. It's in the range of few percent. We don't want few percent. We want a completely new creatures. We want new plants that will grow on salt, uh, you know, which will tolerate salt water, and so and so on. So this is very hard to compare. I would say that traditional uh, breeding will not achieve the goals we need. Mm -hmm. That might be my conclusion. So I started. Okay, perfect. We have another question. <laughs> yeah, nice talk. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So my question is going to the alternative ways already developed in the nature. For sure the crispr cas and gene editing is very useful when you target the genes and you like to produce the lines, uh, for example, resistant against the pathogen. Right? Let's say to produce the body lines which are resistant against the fusai. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the nature there is also another mechanism where these pathogens can be fighted by the good microbes, for example, in the field, so-called beneficial microbes. How do you see the potential of this? Thank you for this question. Obviously, I had to, to narrow down my talk on a specific uh, area or, or solution. Yes, the, the, this is an exciting area, you know, studying the soil microbiome is becoming an exciting area. We see that there are good microbes that help plants to survive uh, stress from drought. So, yes, this is one way to go. I, I don't talk about endophytes, because we know very little about them. So, uh, so yes, this is another area which we should explore. <coughs> but once again, you know, uh, the genomics and, and sequencing and characterizing um, one genomics should help us to, un to, to understand these, these relations. There may be some signaling pathways between the soil bacteria and plant. And once again, we may study the receptors, and we may have other plants to, to communicate with those good uh, uh, microbes. 
Yeah, and, and perhaps uh, if, if I have a, a minute, minute uh, and I think it was mentioned here, the extreme advantage of editing is possibility to, to, for gene pyramiding. You know, uh, my colleague, Brandon Wolf, um, who is working on, on cloning resistant genes, is telling me that if he had five genes of resistant to rust that was mentioned, mm -hmm. the, the, the resistance will not be broken even for 100 years. If there will be on a single gene, the resistance may be broken in 5, 10, 15 years, depending on the population pressure. So the pyramiding, again, would be extremely difficult. We already heard about that. Using classical technique, editing uh, should fulfill and do it. One more question. It will be the last one, so yeah. you prepare. <laughs> Thank you very much. I am not an expert in the biotechnology, not in the genome editing. Uh, my short uh, question is, uh, what is about you the reason why we, uh, why we have so delayed in this and uh, political decision uh, about this in the legislation, you legislation. But I would like to say that it's not to Mr. Blaha that the council has not played a role. It is uh, absolutely uh, different because member states will decide about the legislation. We are European Parliament, we are co-legislators. We call on this, we call for uh, opening the legislation for maybe two years, yeah. but the council has decisive role. We can ask, as our minister of uh, uh, agriculture, a minister of uh, environment, you should ask for the new legislation if we want to move. So just uh, just to a uh, little bit uh, and uh, maybe um, change this uh, this uh, view. You. You, you notice that I avoid legislation. <laughs> Perfect. I'm really sorry, but th okay. this would steer the discussion. Just <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, I don't have a question. I have to react when I sort of refer. In I don't want to be misunderstood. I didn't refer to the European Council. I did refer to the European Commission, which is different. And it's, all of us know, at least those who are in touch with the European Commission, how difficult it is to convince the European Commission that we are more correct than they are. That's what I meant. I mean, if, if there is a simple way to say to the European Commission, just change this piece of legislation in two months, I would be very happy, I would be mostly happy to promote it. And I would be even happier if I see in the European Parliament that this is supported. Because the European Parliament technically is the one who approves it at the final stage. Thing. And I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, this was a little bit too politics for the first session, I think. But you can definitely discuss it later on. And I thank very much you, Professor Dolezal for his speech. And he will now exchange his stage presence with his colleague, Alex Pettinger from the Institute of Experimental Botany of the Czech Republic, the Academy of Sciences. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, dear Madam President, dear members of the European Parliament, uh, Dear colleague scientists, it's really a great honor for me to be here today and to continue this uh, great line of talks on, uh, on possibilities which uh, new genomic techniques offer to us and also to the European agriculture in the future, in the soon future, hopefully. And uh, I will uh, build on examples which already my, my um, uh, colleagues uh, presented before and I will focus more on the, on the scientific uh, aspects of the of the new genomic techniques, and uh, uh, therefore I taught or I called my uh, my talk uh, "New Genomic Techniques: Scientific Discovery of the Century," because, as uh, already mentioned, it was a very short time be between uh, the let's say practical use, practical application of these techniques, and uh, and uh, Nobel Prize award, which is uh, the highest scientific uh, uh, award you can receive. And uh, as already mentioned as well. The plant breeding methods evolve, and uh, I think the people have used always the most advanced methods uh, which were available to them. So until, uh, unfortunately, a uh, long time, uh, mid 19th century or late 19th century, it was only simple selection of uh, naturally occurring uh, traits and modifications. 
Uh, by the work of uh, Gregor Mendel from the late uh, 19th century, we finally understood the rules of heritability and uh, genetics, and this allowed uh, more modern breeding, which was then, uh, um, let's say, um, joined by the development of biotechnology from the mid-20th uh, century. And it was really an explosion of many techniques uh, we are now using uh, in the both laboratories and also breeding stations to improve uh, the crops and to make them better. And this great toolbox uh, was uh, recently extended for these uh, genome editing techniques. So we've heard already about uh, CRISPR-Cas9, but uh, in fact uh, the toolbox is uh, larger and we have also other methods uh, which allow us uh, to, uh, let's say, uh, which other kinds of these, uh, of these molecular scissors which allow us uh, to edit the genomes. And uh, I would like to mention also the zinc finger nucleases and uh, so-called uh, talents. Uh, these methods uh, may have also certain advantages uh, compared to CRISPR, but they are not so popular, at least at the moment, among scientists because they are simply, they require more time, more hands-on time, larger preparation, and, uh, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's technically more complicated. However, they have some principal difference compared to CRISPR system. In zinc finger and, uh, and talent systems, uh, you are not guided by the, by the uh, ribonucle uh, ribonucleic acid, as in CRISPR. So the, the nucleases uh, are guided by a specific protein sequence which recognizes a DNA, certain DNA sequence. And also a very important thing is you need to prepare a pair of those, uh, of those uh, let's say, modules uh, uh, with the nuclease in the middle. Because the nuclease which is used is called FOC1, and you need, a, you need two molecules of this nuclease in order to cut efficiently. Uh, CRISPR, in comparison, is very quick, very efficient, and very simple uh, system, which uses uh, RNA molecule, which uh, creates complex with the Cas9 nuclease. And uh, the RNA molecule, that's the, that's the chip of this GPS, which was already mentioned, that's the one which will find the exact uh, uh, DNA sequence in the genome, and then the CRISPR itself has uh, kind of like a two little teeth, which uh, each of them will cut one DNA strand. And uh, this discovery was really so fundamental that it was awarded this Nobel, Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2020. Let me introduce or let me show you some of the uh, applications we can, we can uh, do with, uh, with CRISPR. And uh, I will go a little bit more in detail of these, uh, of these applications. Uh, so let's see if, if they are appealing to you. So we can do genome editing, which was already mentioned. But we can also do localization of specific proteins, which may be very, very interesting application. So if we use uh, the fully functional Cas9 nuclease, which has these both uh, active uh, sites, we are introducing DNA double strand break. And this is substrate for, for DNA repair system. And this DNA repair system makes, with a certain probability, mistakes. And uh, due to its, uh, let's say, occasional sloppiness, we get uh, so much wanted mutations in our target sequences. And this was already demonstrated on a number of examples as a very efficient technique to, to, to produce uh, uh, genetically modified organisms. Uh, from the examples which uh, are maybe not so intuitive and were not mentioned so far. I would like to mention production of uh, tomatoes, which are producing vitamin D, which is, uh, which is a British invention. Some people uh, mentioned that uh, the Cas9 nuclease could also basically, that the GPS could fail, that it could uh, be guided to some other position and cause some off-target mutation. So there is always this uh, fear from the opponents of the system that we might be introducing into the genome something we don't want to have there. And I think uh, so-called Cas9 nicases offer a very nice uh, possibility to, to have a system which is, which is uh, at least one order of magnitude much, much more precise. So on the left graph you can see uh, how um, one Cas9 uh, nuclease is cutting. You can see there is lots of, at the cutting side, uh, there is lots of insertions and deletions. And for comparison, we have, we have a Cas9, which has only one tooth, not the second tooth, that's the nuclease. And you can see this uh, red flat line at the bottom. So there are no mutations at all. However, if we combine these two Cas9 molecules, so, so, so two Cas9 cases, uh, that's the right graph, 
You can see they are very close to each other. There's only about uh, 20 nucleotides uh, difference between them. Then we suddenly get lots of, uh, lots of uh, DNA uh, changes. So we can have system which is able to modify the genome with uh, extreme precision. And another very appealing uh, function or possibility how to use Cas9 is to completely uh, mutate its enzymatic activity. So we remove both these uh, T's, so the enzyme is not able to cut DNA anymore. However, we can combine it with a certain modifying enzyme. So we can have enzymes which are changing DNA bases or which can modify uh, proteins which are linked to DNA. And with this, we can change chemical properties of these complexes and we can uh, drive, for example, gene activation or silencing. And this is a very nice example where it's a, this is based on zinc finger, where zinc finger was uh, uh, coupled with a uh, human DNA demethylase, so it's a, it's a DNA modifying enzyme, but it does not change the sequence of the, of the uh, genetic letters in DNA. And if this gene was directed to so-called FWA gene, a uh, kind of marker of flowering in model plant Arabidopsis, you can see that uh, this targeting changed the flowering behavior of the plant. So we have also possibilities like this. We, can, we don't need to cut DNA, we can modify certain things, and some of those can even become heritable. So we, are not even, uh, we don't even need to change the DNA sequence. In the, Next part of my talk, I would like to focus uh, on the limitations of the classical breeding. I think many of them were already mentioned, and uh, we really owe a lot to classical breeding because the, it, it allowed the enormous growth of human population in the 20th century. At the same time, uh, we hear that uh, it has a growing cost, uh, and, uh, and uh, many negative aspects uh, are appearing, and simply limitations of this system of this system are more and more obvious. And uh, I think we have agreement in this audience that genome editing could really boost plant uh, breeding. And I prepared a couple of examples, uh, practical examples how this could be achieved. It was already mentioned that many crop varieties we are using at the moment are based on mutation breeding. That means uh, irradiating uh, seeds uh, or whole plants uh, with either um, short uh, ionizing radiation or with uh, certain chemical mutagens and then selecting uh, potentially good mutants from the population. So we have really thousands of varieties which are currently in, in use, which are produced like this. But if you, if you look on the, on the chromosome maps on the right, uh, this, is, uh, this is where we are. We have, uh, with such muta mutagenesis approaches, we have more than 1,000 mutations per genome. This is where we begin. And this is a real example from our own laboratory chemical mutagenesis of uh, the model plant. So these are real mutations which we are seeing. And uh, with uh, CRISPR and with other gene editing methods, we could be in the picture on the on the right side, we could have one precise mutation. I had to highlight it with uh, with an arrow so that you can actually see it. So the solution one, we can really keep our mutations under control. We could also preserve good gene combinations, as already mentioned. In the classical breeding, we use a lot uh, hybridization, uh, like uh, good old Gregor uh, uh, Mendel. But that means with your elite cultivar, which has everything you need, you spend years or sometimes tens of years to, to put it uh, nicely together. Uh, when, you, when you find out that it's, for example, sensitive to certain pathogen, you need to cross it with uh, non-elite cultivar, which has resistance, but is uh, not superior in other traits. And in the first generation, you mix the DNA of those parents one to one. And then you really spend generations and generations selecting it back uh, until the desired combination. And when you find out that you need another trait in it, you start again and again. So this is what, uh, what plant breeders are unfortunately repeating uh, on, the, on the very regular basis. With genome editing, just within two generations, we can have the specific changes introduced in the genome and we can uh, move on without destroying the, the years or decades of work invested into it. Um, very, very important thing, even if you do classical uh, breeding and you spend all this time and uh, carefully select uh, your hybrid genome, you may find out that your, your wanted pathogen resistance gene is sitting next to a gene which is 
for example, causing bitter taste. And what to do now? Because you invested so much into it, so so you have two you have two choices. Uh, currently, actually, only one in Europe. Uh, you can do more screening. You go through several more thousands of plants. You burn a couple of uh, scientists. Uh, you you burn lots of money and energy. And if you are lucky, after many generations, you find out plant which had so-called uh, meiotic recombination event between these two genes, and uh, you get your pathogen resistance without a bitter taste. However, there are parts of chromosomes which are not accessible or which do not really uh, exchange uh, DNA with, with its uh, partner. You know, so if you end up in this part of chromosome, you are unlucky and it will not work. But still, such systems are. Uh, can be fixed with genome editing. You can take your plant uh, uh, in from the fifth generation, and uh, within two generations, you can practically fix your problem. So it's it's really applicable also to materials, many materials which we have uh, in in uh, different uh, stages of breeding. We could we could produce uh, healthier food. Uh, imagine celiac disease or or a so-called gluten intolerance. Uh, this is uh, this is kind of a really big problem for breeders to produce uh, gluten-free cereals. And the simple fact is that uh, that uh, this uh, this disease is called by the products of gliadin genes. And in wheat, there is about 60 of such genes. So imagine removing one by one this classical breeding is practically impossible. So again, genome editing offers a possibility to either simply mutate them. This would be maybe quick, but uh, not so elegant. But it could also change the sequence. It could edit them in a way to reduce the uh, immunogenic potential of those gliadins. So this would be really wonderful because it would not impact so much also the baking quality and, and processing of, uh, of uh, wheat. And uh, the last example, uh, which uh, also builds on what, uh, what my uh, colleagues showed, uh, is uh, potential to de novo de most domesticate, uh, uh, let's say, stronger crops, crops which will have many more uh, resistances to abiotic stress or may have, uh, let's say, uh, certain beneficial traits. And this could be using crops we already have, so starting from some elite material which is existing in their wild pool and within within uh, just uh, some uh, 15 to 30 years we could produce plants which have uh, the good traits and in addition have also lots of uh, for example salt resistance in case of tomato or resistance to certain pathogen and there are discussions that there could be de novo domestication of crops which are not yet existing. Uh, one example is tetraploid rice, uh, which is growing in, in Asia. It's called uh, Oriza Alta. It has about two meters, and it could really be used uh, to produce uh, either rice or lots of, uh, lots of biomass. So this is, uh, this is examples I wanted to show you today, and I hope that I uh, convinced you uh, that uh, these gen genome editing techniques allow uh, lots of changes in quick, safe, and, and uh, precise way in the plant genomes. Uh, they could be solution to many practical problems which we have in classical breeding, so they could really start new green revolution and uh, could accelerate plant breeding for the future needs. With this, I would like to thank my, uh, I would like to end my talk, and I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions if there is time, and if there are any. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? Okay. Thanks for the nice presentation, and you know, I agree with you regarding the potential of genome editing, but nevertheless, we hear um, specifically in view of the precision and the accessibility of parts of the genome for mutations, some criticism from certain NGOs, certain groups saying, well, this precise mutation, uh, in introduction of mutation is not natural. The random one is more, more like natural mutation breeding. And also, um, if you if you um, access parts of the genome with mutation breeding, which are normally not accessible, that's also kind of a risk. So, what would you reply to those, um, let's say, criticism or questions? So, from from the 
let's say, perspective of person, which is uh, in his scientific life dealing with uh, genome stability, with DNA repair, I really don't see any kind of like uh, difference uh, in the mutation introduced by uh, chemical radiation or because, I mean, you have to, you have to think, uh, you first induce DNA damage, and then the mutation is type of repair of this DNA damage. So what we are seeing is uh, some, uh, some uh, let's say, unsuccessful or errors in DNA repair. And uh, until we get there, even the DNA has been amplified many times. So imagine in every, uh, so before every cell division, the DNA is duplicated uh, by its own cellular machinery. And, uh, and uh, so the DNA is copied so many times using natural components in the cell that I don't believe there are any differences. So this would be one argument. And second, uh, now with uh, techniques of, of genome sequencing, we can really take, you know, when we talk about uh, some off targets, now we have really tools in hand when we can take this uh, crop before we put it in the field and we can read the genetic information completely and we can provide scientific proof that there are no off target mutations. So I think uh, we have really tools, very strong tools as a scientist to support this innovative breeding and. Uh, to, to, let's say, show that, uh, that there are no off-targets, for example. And if there are, you always have your other material which you can test in case, you know, uh, this off-target is not there. You can really prove it very nicely before you release anything to the field. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Okay, thanks. One more hand. I may comment on this. I am not sure if this is an answer to the question. Uh, I think the answer would be another question. What's your concern? Is it human safety? Is it elimination of uncertainty, whatever it takes? Uh, is it well-being of the plants or well-being of the people? Maybe it should be worth engaging those NGOs into sort of specifying where they are actually going, what's the concern, what's the reasons for the resistance? It's, it's a rather complex question, but I think uh, what, uh, what, what, uh, is, what, what is really important uh, that we have a tool which uh, can feed more people on less land and uh, you know, still reduce environmental impact of our agriculture, which uh, I think is, is really massive at the moment. And this is where we scientists can can help. I mean, of course, uh, we want to make our work useful. Let's let's be honest about it. Uh, but we have really wonderful tool which uh, currently we are not able to use practically, uh, which we are not able to maybe transfer to to practice in at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. first question they were just shaking their hand like no that's not really the question but the question still stays because there are many people asking these questions mm -hmm. and it's good that it, it sounded here and we will discuss it tomorrow further how to yes. persuade the society so there will be a yeah. whole new topic but now it's time to close the first session and I would like I would like to ask Orna Dima from the EU stage to come on the stage thank you I'm very happy to be here and thank you to the Czech Academy of Sciences to organize this event on genome editing in this timely uh, manner during the Czech uh, presidency and also together with the EU SAGE. Uh, we thank you very much. Um, and EU SAGE, so European Sustainable Agriculture through Genome Editing, I would like to tell you a little bit more today about our activities and about the role of uh, scientists in policy making. So did you know that there are more than 600 uh, different genome editing applications in the crops that have been already published? So knowing that there are so many applications in, in literature, uh, I wonder whether genome editing and this innovation will be allowed to play a role in the Green Deal and uh, what is at its heart of the farm to fork strategy. So we've been talking about the uh, farm to fork and uh, its objectives. So uh, we could uh, 
work on the reducing the food waste by uh, obtaining the plants with the prolonged shelf life. We could uh, work on the sustainable food production. We've already heard the example of grapes. So what about uh, using less pesticides and having the same grape varieties and having the same strains where, where we could use uh, less pesticides and at the same time obtain the wine that we like, so which is Sangiovese or Merlot or Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, so there is this potential for farm to fork strategy and we as scientists, we. Uh, all realize that very much, and it has been also discussed in, uh, by the Commission and the, uh, in the European Parliament. And um, we've also, as scientists, we've, uh, um, we've published this position paper, uh, which was initiated by Professor Dirkinzi, uh, saying that regulating uh, genome edited organs as GMOs has negative impact for the agriculture, economy, or the society. I would like to tell you then more how the usage started. So indeed, after the ruling, we published this position paper, and then many more scientists joined uh, our position, and we launched the, the network in 2020, and in 21, we have became the legal entity. So what are our aims, our goals? The EU stage stands for representing scientists in Europe, uh, working on genome editing. We advocate for the potential of genome editing uh, for sustainable agriculture, and we uh, work on facilitating the science-based policy making. Uh, right now we have members all across Europe. You can see that on our website. Um, and uh, we have uh, more than 150 members right now from uh, research institutes, different European research institutes and learned societies working on uh, plant biotechnology from uh, different countries. So uh, we still invite you to all the scientists here gathered. If you still are not a member and you would like to join, you are welcome to do so. The membership is free of charge. And if you have any more questions, I will be available here to, to answer. So during the, the years, our goal um, developed and it evolved into a, a goal to have a differentiated regulatory framework for genome edited plants, which could have also uh, been obtained uh, naturally or through conventional breeding. And why? Because there is currently no differentiated approach for the regulation of genome-edited crops in Europe, and this map has been already shown, and I think it will be still discussed a few times, and it is to visualize that in the majority of cases, in the majority of the continents, uh, there are some genome-edited crops that are not regulated as GMOs, while uh, there, is, there are still many countries where the discussion is ongoing and right now the Europe is the hot spot, we are discussing it right now and therefore this uh, conference actually and the presence also of the members of the European Parliament, the scientists and, and everyone together. So I would like to introduce you a little bit more on the, on the policy developments that happened in the EU to understand a little bit better the process. So after the court ruling, the European Council asked the European Commission to perform a study on new genomic techniques, and this actually happened, where also scientists contributed to this study. And in 2021, the Commission published this study, and also, what is very important, it's already um, said that uh, they would like to initiate a policy proposal for the legislative change. So, uh, this study was concluded based on many different stakeholders' um, contributions, based on the member states' contributions, uh, based on the EFSA contribution, GRC, group of chief scientific advisors, the a group of ethics, the um, European Network of GMO Laboratories. So this is very comprehensive work. And there were many um, outcomes that uh, came out of this study which the most important were that still all genome edited crops remain GMOs. However, there is this policy action of plant products derived from targeted mutagenesis and cisgenesis. And also the GRC concluded in its study that by 2030 there will be significant amount of genome edited products 
uh, to be expected on the market. But right now we have only two products on the market. So uh, this has been already mentioned. There is a high oleic soybean in the U.S., which have a food uh, benefits, uh, which health benefits, sorry, and the uh, tomato, which lowers blood pressure in Japan. Now coming back to the policy developments, now we are actually at the moment where we are discussing this legislative proposal. So there have been already public consultation, there has been a, a public consultation on the, uh, this legislative proposal. EU Sage contributed also to many targeted questionnaires concerning this proposal. And um, in 2023, there will be the earliest legislative change possible. But what is, the very, what is very important right now is that the members of the European Parliament talk within the Parliament about it and um, raise the, the knowledge and the concerns about the climate change and so on and everything that we are discussing here. So the members of the European Parliament are prepared <coughs> to vote for this legislative proposal as well as the member states. So the Czech Republic has a very important voice here as well. So there are only two products on the market of the crops uh, derived from genome editing right now. And then as scientists, we thought like, okay, so uh, we, we get the question, so yeah, there are only two products, so why can we make all the fuss about it? Well, look, there is already research ongoing, and right now, up to date, there are 622 publications that we could screen from all the research articles that uh, that are now published and present and for that we created this interactive interactive database where you can also search for different traits that have been worked on for different plants or where this technique uh, or where this trait was worked on so in what part of the world and the main outcomes of this uh, database well sorry i was already introduced that maybe still uh, i will add that the model plants were not screened. So uh, plants like Paradopsis are not mentioned in this database. And we also didn't screen for patents. So the main outcomes of this database is that it is used in a wide variety of crops, in 63 different crops. That's a big number. And you can see that even in, in tomato, there are already uh, almost 100 applications. So these all it has a very big potential from, from these numbers that you can see. Also, if you look at the traits, the top three are the very important traits for the consumers and for the farmers, which are the improved food and feed quality, which are the, the plant yields and, and growth, which are the biotic stress resistance. So these traits are very uh, important also in the parliament also to, to discuss. And if you look at the, at the countries, well, it has been stated, uh, I remember in the introductory video, that um, the Europe is lagging behind. Yes, on the legislative level, indeed. And, um, but look, as the research, after it's, it's hard to compete with China and US, but on the, on the research level, the EU is, has a very big potential, so let's and release this potential and uh, put it and, and make it work further for us. Um, so as I said, uh, there are currently 63 different crops in the research that are, that are researched on, the, on different traits uh, in, in genome editing. The traits are relevant for farmers and consumers. And what is also very important, the majority of this literature which we screen are as the scientists call it as the ones so the small genetic changes. So these changes, we uh, talk about them as these are the ones that could have occurred naturally or through conventional breeding. And also, um, this database actually also demonstrates that genome editing can contribute to the farm for strategy. So it has been also mentioned Brexit and UK. So in UK, this genome editing vitamin D tomato that has been already mentioned, well, it is already on the field trials. 
the, the, the permission has been obtained immediately and the scientists can proceed with that. And we would like to have the same opportunity in the EU with our research uh, um, outcomes to test it in the fields because that's just the next step and then to introduce it on the market. So um, I would like to thank you very much uh, for your attention. I'm aware of time, so I try to be as much consistent as possible. And I would also like to take this opportunity to let you know that EU SAGE uh, had a meeting with the European Commission, with the, with the DG Sante unit, the unit which is working on this new legislative proposal. And we have been talking with them what would um, because we've also contributed to this targeted questionnaire. And there we discovered the Commission worked on some criteria that you could define this uh, genome edit crops that could have been obtained naturally or through conventional breeding. Now, what are these criteria? According to the European Commission, they are very, very strict. And therefore, we had that meeting to, uh, to talk further about it. And the outcome of the meeting was that the Commission is uh, very um, open to hear the scientist proposal on this legislation for the plants derived from targeted mutagenesis and cisgenesis. Therefore, we would like to propose an ad hoc meeting of the scientists uh, after the, the conference tomorrow, after lunch, as far as I understood. We could still use the, uh, the room here to discuss, and we'll then uh, we will have another meeting with the commission within somewhere right, like two weeks to present the, the first outcomes of such meetings. So you are all very welcome. I think it's very important and, and timely meeting uh, to, to use it to actually uh, do the science-based policy making. Thank you very much for the introduction of the usage. Also, on, 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 thank you for the update. Any questions? No questions. Everybody's hungry. Everybody's hungry. Okay. All right. So maybe we will have more time for the coffee break, if that is okay for all of you. All right. Thank you very much for your respectful attention. And we have time for the refreshment now. And we will meet here in the conference room again in, at 16.20 or 4.20 p.m. for those who are on 12 hours.
Really looking forward to hearing their talks. Um, and again, questions are very welcome, so get prepared. Um, in this topic, in this session, we will look beyond the science, the NGT science, more towards the broader context of sustainability. What does it take to achieve it? Because the fact is that the advantage of NGTs or the new methods can be fully exploited only when all possible drivers work together. And by the drivers, I mean technological, economical, social drivers. In this term, the industry perspective is also very important, so we will hear that as well. Now, as the first one, let me invite on the stage Mr. René Kaster from the Flanders Institute for Biotechnology. Thank you, and uh, I would also like to thank the, the Czech uh, Academy for organizing this meeting. Um, uh, very important and very, uh, very timely. Um, I'm already, well, moving, well, uh, uh, the introduction was about uh, um, social, uh, economic, and, 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 and um, those kinds of uh, uh, challenges. Uh, I'm going to dive already a little bit more into what we should do from a regulatory point of view um, to be able to unlock the uh, genome editing potential. Before doing that, I'm going to start on a uh, rather personal note. Um, I was actually raised on, the, on an arable farm um, in an environment looking a little bit, uh, little bit like this, where my father used to uh, grow uh, especially potatoes uh, and, and some other crops, where he was facing uh, the challenges um, that we have been discussing already for quite a bit uh, today. So um, on potatoes, it was uh, uh, fu uh, fungal disease, which was a big problem, um, making him spray at least 10 times per season. Um, there were uh, weeds, of course, in, in all those crops. Um, there were aphids uh, popping up at, at certain moments. And uh, those were a number of the challenges that, that, that he was facing and, and dealing with uh, at, at that moment. Um, those challenges, I think, uh, have not really changed uh, for farmers uh, nowadays. Um, a, a lot of the things um, he could manage, but um, one thing, of course, he couldn't manage, and that was the weather. Um, and today we have uh, quite a, a, a nice weather uh, outside, outside, but um, with the conditions that are, that are changing and what we've seen in, in recent years, I think that is a, an extremely big worry for, uh, for farmers nowadays. Huh? Uh, spending a lot of effort in, in trying to get a crop uh, and, get, and getting uh, a yield and, and a harvest and a product out there, and then uh, having a flood or something else, which then, uh, huh? also from an econo economic point of view, is a, is a disaster. Um, um, a second personal note, um, huh? looking at uh, what we have at our dinner table, and. This is in my kitchen at home, uh, looking at the great variety that uh, plant breeding has, has provided us. Uh, these are uh, four different or five different uh, varieties of tomatoes in different shapes and different colors. Uh, I think it's great and it's wonderful what uh, plant breeding has achieved over, over the years. Um, uh, uh, slicing them, putting a little bit of uh, uh, salt and pepper on them, uh, a, a pinch of uh, uh, olive oil and, and, and a little squeeze of lemon, and this makes a great salad. Eh? That's, I think, uh, one of the joys what uh, uh, agriculture uh, is, is, is bringing us. Uh, of course, we can turn it in all, all kinds of uh, stuff, uh, which we all can uh, can enjoy, and I think that is uh, really uh, well, well, what it's all uh, what it's all about. Um, I think we all uh, also love nature, um, and we want to protect it. Um, and this is a nice picture, of course, uh, taken somewhere uh, at the border of the Netherlands and Belgium. Um, but even this picture, I think, is a managed environment. I think in Europe, in many places, um, the environment is, is somehow managed. Um, and those are, I think, a little bit of the context uh, of, of the things that we are discussing today. Yeah? Agriculture and, and food production has an enormous impact on, uh, on our lives and on the environment. And I think we have heard already quite a bit on the challenges that lie uh, ahead. Uh, these are a number of things that, uh, that have been discussed already. I'm just uh, putting them up uh, to, uh, to reiterate them. Uh, I'm putting in the middle um, the, the climate change uh, story, which I think is, is really, 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 uh, really pressing. Um, 
Genome editing has also been presented. Um, it is, of course, a tool in the toolbox of breeders. Yeah? Uh, genome editing is not going to replace everything. It will be used there where it's beneficial. Uh, conventional breeding will also still be applied to uh, produce the varieties that, that thrive in the different environments and, and different circumstances. So that will always be uh, very important. Uh, but I think the most important um, advantage is that it allows to achieve a number of breeding goals in a faster and much more targeted way. I think that is uh, the key word here. Um, eh? A personal note again, I think, well, it may be ir irresponsible not to use uh, genome editing in plant breeding. I also would like to use the word responsibility um, uh, also in, in another context. I also think that we have a responsibility to use the technology responsibly. Um, and I think that is uh, something that is uh, very important uh, to all of us. And, and that's also, um, I think, a duty that we have towards society as a whole. Um, the GMO legislation, I think, um, this is what I would like to represent what the GMO legislation is doing for genome editing. Um, I think it makes it de facto impossible. Uh, look at how, what, what uh, the GMOs uh, that are currently on the market in Europe, only for import, and there's only one crop that can be cultivated in, in Europe, and uh, if you apply that to, uh, to genome edited uh, crops, then um, that is not something that is going to fly. Um, putting the three things next to each other, so the conventional, I think it's mentioned already, there are on a genome level lots of different things that are under the umbrella of, of conventional. And the genome editing is uh, much more targeted and, and introducing small changes. And we have the, the old-fashioned GMO where we introduce additional pieces of, uh, of DNA, mostly foreign uh, DNA. Um, and we, this is, and, and this is what uh, the dilemma that I think the European Commission and, and, and member states and the parliament is facing today. How should we go about in, in organizing this in a consistent and proportionate manner? Um, this is what eh, the, the court ruling has resulted in. Um, eh, applying the, the legislation that is uh, um, applying to trans to, 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 to traditional GMOs also on top of uh, the genome edited uh, plants. And that of course, um, eh, which I made the remark, uh, is, is well, killing, killing the, te the, the technology. Um, the difficulty then is, if you want to do it in another way, how should we exactly do that? We can well, um, look at the regulatory window that applies to conventional and also apply that to genome edited plants or to part of the genome edited plants. And that are things that I think are currently discussed and which are very important. The difficulty then is, of course, to determine where should we uh, place that border between uh, between the two. I think that is a very important scientific discussion as well. There are lots of scientific arguments in one direction and the other direction. Um, we can learn an awful lot from what is happening in plants in, in conventional breeding. And I think that is um, yeah, a very important debate that we uh, all should have uh, together. Um, uh, there have been discussions on, okay, what type of plants should be risk assessed? And I understand that the European Commission also has specifically asked that question to, for instance, EFSA. I think that is not a correct question, which of those plants should be risk assessed. I think the real question is, which of those plants should be subject to a regulatory system which requires a pre-market risk assessment? Because even in the conventional and, and things alike, people will think about what they do and perform a risk assessment. Yeah? Uh, so it's really about which of the things that you want to put under regulatory scrutiny and have official government um, checks on, uh, on, on, on them. Um, putting it in, in another 
yeah, a little bit other perspective. Eh? Here on the, on the left-hand side, there is more emphasis on breather responsibility and on liability. You would be stupid to place something on the market which is not healthy or uh, unsafe or has detrimental effects for the environment. And then the other side is have more emphasis on pre-market uh, verification. Um, this area and, and where do we put the line is, is, is part of the discussion. If we do that, would that then lead to unacceptable risks? And I think that is also a, a very important point in, in the discussion. And again, I think a lot of the answer lies in what we can learn from what has happened in conventional breeding. Because also conventional breeding can lead to uh, a combination of traits in, in an organism where at a certain point there may be problems. History has shown that those uh, cases are rare. And those cases have also been addressed in practice. So the, the, the history of, of what has been performed here in the conventional area, I think, is, 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 is very important. There is another possibility as well. That is, well, regulate those things in three, different, in three different ways. I have no idea what the Commission is planning and how they would like to do it. That is a possibility, of course, uh, as well. This creates difficulties still in, in... This could be somehow proportionate, but then on the, on the other hand, it will sustain a number of the problems that we have with the current situation. Because still, with a genome-edited uh, crop, where you introduce a specific change that could also occur naturally, you still regulate plants with the same properties made with different technologies in different ways. And that, of course, is, uh, is, is, is uh, yeah, something that you would like to, uh, to avoid. Um, there's lots of discussion about what is conventional and what is not conventional. What can conventional do? Conventional has had an impact on the composition of plants that is evolving and changing over time. And this is just a simple example where this is very visible because uh, huh, uh, this is about uh, the anthocyanin uh, production in, in, in cauliflower, uh, which only happened after the introduction of, uh, of the purple uh, cauliflower. Um, conventional is an awful lot of things. And these are all kinds of things that have happened in, in, in plants over uh, the course of time. Um, and I think, um, yeah, it's, it's very important to consider what, uh, what, what, uh, how we should regard this in the context of, uh, of genome editing. Um, same change, different technology. I think that is uh, something that we would like to uh, well, prevent that that is being uh, 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 regulated in different ways. Uh, you can have it uh, here, uh, well, the example of conventional random mutagenesis compared to genome editing. But even within genome editing, you can have different technologies with the same result. Oh. What did I do? Yeah. Um, because uh, people are all referring to SDN1 type, SDN2 type, SDN3 type. Uh, but eh, those different subtypes of technology can also re result in the same exact same type of modification at the, at the, at the genomic level. And also there we should try to uh, prevent uh, regulating that in, uh, in, in different ways. Um, looking at how we should regulate things, I think it is very important also to look beyond borders and what is happening there. And we can learn from the approaches in other countries like, for instance, in South America, uh, but also in Japan uh, and, 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 and other countries. Um, this is also important from the context that, um, well, uh, foods are commodities that are traded worldwide, of course. Uh, uh, regulating things in a different way in, in different regions in the world will create uh, problems in trade. And, and that's something you also would like to, uh, like to avoid. Um, in my view, if you would like, well, really like to unlock that genome editing potential in, in the context of uh, the whole regulatory uh, debate, um, there are a number of things that, uh, that are important. Um, really focus on, on 
taking true account of what conventional means and what our experience with that is and what that experience tells us. And I think that would also, well, should result in, in treating a certain category in the same way as we treat uh, conventional. Um, again, I, well, I, I repeat that message here. Huh? Do not regulate plants with the same changes uh, in, in, in different ways. Um, I think that would create uh, discriminatory uh, uh, situations. The GMO legislation, um, you could envisage that you would make a GMO light regime for certain types of GMO crops. But if that remains under the GMO legislation with its labeling and, and everything attached to that, that I think is not going to work. That I think will still will create a, a situation where perhaps it is not uh, completely killed, I would say, but then um, the genome editor crops would still be on a very tight leash. And, and, and that is also, uh, I think, something that is not going, uh, not going to work. Um, there is a need for transparency, though. Um, ha showing what genome editing is used for and, and what that type of uh, applications are, are being performed in practice. And that is difficult, I think. It's not, it's, well, it's easy to say, but difficult, of course, to achieve in, in, in reality. Um, that beyond the EU border is very important. Um, and the last point I would like to make is that in the current situation we have um, genetically modified organisms being dominated by a few uh, large uh, 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 corporations. I think with genome editing there lies an opportunity to broaden that scope to also allow medium and smaller companies to enter that market. That would also allow uh, to create a situation where the diversity in the European uh, agricultural system with small crops, with large crops, with niche crops, with different regions, different types of agriculture could be better served. And I think that is also uh, an angle that should be taken along when thinking about and trying to develop uh, a new regulatory situation. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Question, perfect. Okay, thank you for this interesting contribution. And I agree completely with your li uh, last slide. But my main question is about so your slide where you show in a shadow uh, conventional breeding and a part of the uh, genome editing. And then you have made in bracket unacceptable risk. Who should uh, decide that these plants has no risk and should be regulated like maybe a conventional plant. Who, That's who? Well, because in the moment we have the discussion all man-made mutations except uh, classical mutation must be regulated. And when, you're, when I look on your picture I have a suggestion that you believe that we can put out some plants derived from uh, NGTs. And then you have to make the bracket. Uh, put out, you mean exempt uh, from? Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, exempt, uh, exempting certain well, types of genome editor crops is an option, of course. Uh, that's, that's a possibility. Um, and, and that, of course, is what you see in certain uh, regions in, in, in the world that has been yeah. done. Yeah whether or not you should place a verification process on that uh, where there is some information shared and uh, check that something indeed is falling within that category, I think that's, uh, that, that's, that's another point of discussion. Uh, but that is not creating a, a um, well, uh, I, I would not call that a risk assessment, uh, pre-market risk assessment authorization system. That is just, just uh, another type uh, of, of, of working. Okay, so I have some problems with that, but nevertheless, okay, maybe there are other questions. Okay, so many questions. Hang on, I will just walk around here.
thank you. Uh, I was, I'm wondering, we are very often mentioning the concept of risk and risk assessment here, but we should perhaps be dealing with the question, what sort of risk? It's obvious that, as you said, no one wants to eat something what's uh, understand, probably not healthy or not safe or dangerous for the environment. But what about risks to values and beliefs? And I would fully accept that there is a part of society who considers something a risk to values and beliefs even in the absence of the other risks. And in that context, labeling, not regulation, would make the sense. Yeah. I'm, I'm not a fan of, of labeling where you just would merely label the use of a certain technology because I, th I, th I, I, I think that is very uninformative to, to people that, uh, that are confronted with that, uh, with that label. I would try to find hopefully other ways of, of better informing because, because such a label that only focuses on the use of a certain technology within a context where the wider population is not very well informed about the history of plant breeding and the use of technology and innovation in plant breeding as a whole, I think, well, is asking for problems. Um, I do uh, take your point in terms of huh, risks, okay. I've been mainly discussing about risk for human health and, and the environment. There is, of course, um, a wider debate on sustainability as, as a whole where it's more uh, than just about safety, there it's also more about uh, the socio-economic, ethical and, and, uh, and, uh, and other con considerations. Um, those things are important as well. Um, I think we should realize that the European Commission is working on sustainability as a whole under the umbrella of Green Deal and Farb to Fork strategy. And um, having that discussion um, is, is important, uh, but I'm personally not very much in favor of having those types of things, things specifically attached to the use of one specific technology. I think that is something that should be on a more general level, um, helping to move the whole of the sector in, in a more sustainable direction. There was one more question. Yeah, I just wanted to um, comment on, on what you said to, um, regarding the GMO light system. So you mentioned that this is not a, actually a way forward, just also because of labeling um, and, and, and those kind of things. So I think from, from, from our perspective, it's, it's not only, let's say, the, the scope and the requirements um, in view of, for example, risk assessment, um, it's, it's also the whole process, the whole approval process, which is really challenging um, when we look at the GMO system. So it's, it's highly politicized. We have EFSA providing, let's say, a, a recommendation, but in the end it's the Commission and, and member states in this comitology procedure deciding, uh, more or less, let's say, independent of, of the EFSA recommendation, um, because many countries just don't follow that recommendation. And, and that's the, the main challenge for, for products, um, um, for, like, like for, for GMOs, not coming to the market, actually. Yeah, I, I fully agree. Eh? So, so labeling is, is one point there, but the, the, the whole decision-making process as it is, is, is as you mentioned, uh, just a, as big as a problem. Right. Thank you, Mr. Guster. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I think we are all glad that you didn't have your presentation before the coffee break, considering the beginning <laughs> with all the, your food and everything. So our next speaker works in Euro seats, but is also an advocacy expert with more than 20 years of experience in science and industry policy framework. Please welcome Petra Yorash. Thanks a lot for the nice introduction. Also, thanks for the kind invitation. I'm, I'm happy to uh, yeah, present the, let's say, the industry view on, on, on the whole discussion. Um, I titled my presentation, How Plant Breeding Innovation Can Help Reconciling Sustainability with Agricultural um, Productivity. And um, some of the earlier talks already touched upon the challenges we face in view of um, the political crisis, but also climate crisis. And I would like to um, 
start my presentation first of all with introducing who, who we are as Euroseeds, but then also um, looking a bit uh, back on what plant breeding in the past actually already contributed to to kind of meeting those challenges and, and how the new innovations in plant breeding can even more um, help plant breeding to, 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 to meet those challenges. Um, who are we? Um, so Euroseeds is the European representation of the plant breeding and seed sector. We represent um, national seed associations and uh, it's uh, 36, it's going beyond the European Union. So we also have members from UK, Ukraine, Turkey, Morocco. Um, so it's, it's, it's larger than the EU only. And we have also direct company members uh, at, at the moment, uh, 67 company members. It's um, multinational companies, but it's also a number of um, small and medium sized companies. And of course, our interest is to represent their interests towards the European institutions. Some facts and figures about our sector, um, and I highlighted one here, which is uh, the R&D spending. And this is specifically important in the context of new plant breeding techniques, because um, our companies spend up to 20% of their annual turnover again into research and development. So we are a highly innovative sector. And of course, innovations like new plant breeding techniques are very important for our companies. Um, in total, we um, provide around 3,500 new varieties each year to the, to the common catalogue of varieties. So that's agricultural crops, but of course also vegetables. And um, I think that's a huge diversity and choice for farmers. Of course, not all of those varieties have the same kind of market share. There are some more, um, let's say, successful than others. But in principle, it's a huge um, choice for farmers. And, and um, in total, we have currently like 42,000 varieties on the, on the, on the EU market um, listed on the EU common catalog. So in principle, um, farmers could, could uh, use those varieties to, for, for crop production and vegetable production. How do we look at the new um, plant breeding techniques? And that was also already mentioned in one of the earlier um, presentations. So um, we, we now say new genomic techniques, but in fact, since the discoveries of the genet laws of genetics by Gregory Mendel in 1866, plant breeders started to develop new breeding techniques in order to make plant breeding um, becoming a real science on the one hand, but also to, be, to become more efficient. And, and it all started with uh, crossbreeding and one of the, um, um, one, one kind of crossbreeding is of course hybrid breeding, which um, successfully contributed to, to productivity in, in, in uh, crop production in, uh, in the past almost 100 years. But then we also had like new um, uh, ways of introducing genetic diversity, which is of course um, um, mutation breeding, which we did with um, radiation and chemicals in the past. And um, so, of course, the more we knew about genes and their function, um, the more plant breeders could make use of, of this um, knowledge to, to, um, to make breeding even more efficient. And what we are talking about today, uh, I called it here precision breeding. So it's um, something which can um, address some of the um, goals which we already also addressed in the past with other methods, but now we can do it in a more targeted and more precise way. And all these methods add to the toolbox of a plant breeder. So it's not one replacing the other, but depending on the goal a breeder needs to solve, he uses the one or the other method. And, and I think that's an important message here as well, because we should also not overpromise with uh, genome editing or new, new genomic techniques. Um, it's one tool in the breeder's toolbox, but crossing and selection will still be the basis of plant breeding also in the future. Um, just looking a bit back, um, we did a study in, uh, two years ago um, to assess the contribution of plant breeding to crop productivity in Europe. And what we found here is that 66% um, of the annual productivity growth goes back to genetic improvement, so to plant breeding. The rest is improved technology in agriculture, of course, uh, inputs like pesticides and fertilizers, but 66% goes back to plant breeding. 
and uh, overall crops and uh, over past 20 years it's 1.16 percent of um, yield increase per year that is okay but probably not enough if we look at our challenges um, not only in view of climate change etc but also in view of the policy goals which um, should be implemented by 2030 and that's pesticide use reduction it's fertilizer use reduction it's more uh, organic production and also putting out certain um, uh, agricultural farmland out of production so that means there will be a, uh, let's say a huge pressure on on productive on, on on european agricultural productivity and how to compensate this well plant breeding can help compensating um, so if we do some forecasts and we look at uh, plant breeding at the current pace so this 1.16 percent per year and we look at different crops and different countries but also overall EU um, we would see that um, currently um, so the the farm to fork strategy would um, um, reduce productivity by by 20 23 percent over all crops um, and 10 percent of that comes from non-productive farmland and 13 percent of lower yield because of less input um, when we continue breeding, like like I just said, 1.16%, um, um, until 2030, we would not be able to compensate for those productivity losses. Um, and only until 2040, we might be able to compensate um, for some of the crops, while for others, we would still face a reduction of productivity compared to today. And... Um, what does it mean? So if we want to contribute as plant breeders to this productivity compensation, we need to speed up. And the new tools can be one, um, let's say, measure to, to help plant breeding to speed up and to be able to compensate those productivity losses um, earlier than um, 2040. But if we look at, let's say, also the regulatory um, uh, developments and we discussed the whole topic not only since 2018 when we had the European Court of Justice ruling but um, already since 2008. Uh, in 2008 the Commission established a first working group dealing with those new methods and CRISPR wasn't even invented. So um, if we continue to um, let's say um, have uh, this long-term discussions um, continuing so then we probably will not um, uh, be able to to um, to speed up breeding as it as it needs. So where can those new uh, technologies play a role in the breeding cycle? Um, and it's not only a breeding what is listed here, but starting with basic plant research, and and those figures in the circle um, they are not absolute figures. They are up to so many years because it's also dependent, of course, on the crop. Um, but there you can see, so those technologies can play a role in, in different um, um, parts of the, of, the, of the breeding, of the variety development um, circle. So it can be used in, a, in basic research, of course, in translational research, in applied research, um, for example, in view of public-private partnerships also, which is very important specifically for our small and medium-sized companies. And then, of course, also during variety development, when you already have a good germplasm, so a good variety, which you would just like to add one characteristic, then, of course, here you can also use those technologies. And, um, yeah, so they, they can really play an important role in different parts, and they could help, up, uh, could help uh, speed up uh, the breeding process. Um, that's just one example, um, so a fungi resistant uh, uh, wheat um, and just a calculation also from this study which I already mentioned. Um, so if we would be able to reduce fungicide applications by one or two applications per year um, and we would be able to grow those uh, fungi resistant varieties on 10, 25 or 50 percent of the wheat acreage in the European Union, we could potentially avoid 25 million applications of fungicides. So that's definitely a contribution to, to sustainability in agriculture. Um, 
I just want to show a few um, uh, figures on um, how, how our members really look at those uh, technologies because there's some messaging like it's only the big companies who have interest, etc. So we did a survey within our membership and we got uh, 62 replies. 10% um, of the companies were big uh, multinationals, uh, medium-sized 37 and 53% small companies. And you can see the, how, we, how we group them uh, um, on this slide. So it's also somehow reflecting the, let's say, the diversity of our, of our overall membership. And as you can see here from um, the replies, um, it's not only the, the big companies who have an interest in using those technologies, it's also the small and medium-sized companies who have a huge interest. And um, we also asked if the European Court of Justice ruling had an impact on their R&D activities with those technologies. And also here you see, of course, it had already an impact uh, because a number of companies reduced their activities or even stopped them. Um, some moved the product focus out of EU markets and specifically, of course, here the um, bigger companies are in a competitive um, advantage because they have research facilities somewhere else in the world while many smaller and medium-sized companies are focused on the EU markets, they have their R&D facilities here and they suffer more from the current regulatory situation than some of the bigger companies. And we also asked what kind of factors are the most limiting factors in view of the current regulatory situation and it's specifically regulatory costs, public acceptance under the current GM regulation, uh, which is of course also linked to, to labeling of technology and then, of course, legal certainty and future regulations and timelines. So to not know when exactly uh, such kind of a potential regulatory uh, change will, will happen, but also in view of product approval times, um, which can least up until uh, 10 years for, for current GMOs. So how do other countries make those technologies work? And I have just two examples here. One is from Argentina and one is from um, uh, Japan. And most of the countries have actually kind of decision tree mechanisms in place. So um, developers are required to present certain information to authorities and based on certain criteria, those authorities decide it's a GMO or it's a conventional like um, plant and is regulated as conventional. And um, from my perspective, there's no country regulating those technologies or those plants resulting from the technologies as a third category of, of, of products. It's either GM or it's conventional. No? Ah. Yeah. So you have already seen uh, this kind of maps in, in several of the presentations. Um, uh, this is one that we um, uh, regularly update together with our International Seed Federation and, and actually it's, it reflects what has already been shown. So there's a growing number of dark green countries, so those who have those kind of decision tree mechanisms in place or even exempting certain products from the beginning and, and that regulate those products which are conventional-like also as conventional um, varieties. And I think this is also a nice example um, uh, published from, from Argentina and where you can also see that enabling regulations really have an effect on local developers and, and support local developers and, and also diversity of developers. And, and uh, on the right hand side, it's the classical GMO approval system uh, where you have 95% of foreign developers, while on the left hand side, it's NGT product notifications and 66% of those came from local developers and um, only 28% from foreign developers. So you can see that enabling regulations not only um, um, facilitate, um, let's say, bigger companies and, and, and foreign developers, but really local, local companies, also public uh, signs, etc. So that, also, that will also have an effect on the diversity of, of products with, that will be on the market, of course. So conclusions, I hope I could show you that plant breeding has a proven track record um, of boosting sustainability options for agriculture. 
not only in view of environmental sustainability, but also societal, so quality health effects and economic sustainability, and that's specifically interesting, of course, for farmers. Um, and NGTs, actually, they provide additional opportunities to be more sustainable, specifically by reducing the breeding time and by, by allowing more targeted breeding approaches, specifically for complex genomes, for, for um, crops with long uh, generation times, etc. Enabling regulations for NGTs would support local developments and increase diversity of the developers. And also, um, we would um, like the EU to follow um, the, the principle, which they also um, have as a result of their own study, that NGT applications are versatile and can be used in many different ways for different products. Some of them might be GMO-like, classical GMO-like. Some of them are conventional-like. And we hope that the EU follows the growing number of countries um, taking this into consideration and not um, put those products under biotech regulations which are conventional-like, so meaning they could have been produced through conventional breeding or by or through natural processes. And with this, I end my presentation. Thank you very much. Are there questions? Yes. Uh, Petra, uh, perfect presentation, only I like to tell one comment yeah, for the uh, medium and small size breeder company. Is the new breeder technology, in case of new breeder technology using uh, and not under for uh, regulation GMO, need to keeping uh, full breeder exception. Yeah, because in case will be uh, will be not this uh, this uh, full breeding exception will be very big problem for the development is the and breeding in the small and medium sized company. Thank you. And sorry, you know the yeah. in the SR. Yeah. Thanks for the comment, and um, maybe for those who are not familiar with breeders' exemption, that's related to intellectual property protection, um, so plant variety protection, where breeders can make use of the germplasm of other breeders uh, to further, let's say, to continue breeding. And uh, the comment was about making this also available for um, plants resulting from the new technologies. And I can assure you that this is um, under discussion also within the breeding sector to find uh, instruments to allow this um, access to germplasm, which might have been the result of those new, to uh, new technologies. Anybody else? So thank you for a very interesting presentation. You showed uh, increase of crop yield, annual crop yield for European countries, right? Could you compare it with some other countries where there's different legislation, legislature, uh, so that we can actually like somehow evaluate the impact of, of European policy? I'm sorry, I, I mean, this was conventional breeding, just to, um, to avoid any misunderstanding. So this is looking back uh, 20 years, and the 1.16% per were conventional crops, not GMOs. Um, I don't have figures um, comparing conventional yield increase um, Europe with other regions of the world. I'm sorry. Nevertheless, you might have noticed that we have a speaker from Argentina tomorrow, so maybe he will have some figures because he will um, show us or tell us about the situation in Argentina more in detail. Thank you, Messi Rush. Uh, our next speaker uh, will join us online. It is Dennis Eriksson from the INN University in Norway, who also coordinates the recent Horizon Euro project Gene Beacon. Hello, Mr. Eriksson. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Hello? Hello, hello, we hello. can hear you. <laughs> perfect. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Ah, yes, perfect, excellent. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and for the, um, for the invitation to this conference. 
Yeah, I should add that also I have I actually have a dual affiliation, and uh, in this case I am representing or in this in this um, context now for this project I'm representing the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences in Sweden, uh, whereas I'm always affiliated with the Norwegian Institute. Uh, but in any case, so. Um, uh, thanks again for the invitation, and I will talk about an EU project that has been recently granted. Uh, so I'm, I'm coordinator for uh, an EU project called Gene Bacon. Uh, it's a Horizon Europe project on gene editing. Uh, that started, we started now on the 1st of September, and uh, we will run for three years. I will argue that this is a very, very, <clears throat> very timely and very important project, given uh, the current level of global technical innovation in gene editing and also its, its impact in many different sectors and also this together with the intensity of the corresponding regulatory discussions. As we've heard the two previous speakers talk about this, so it's, um, it, it, it is very, very important for many stakeholders, I think. And this, this calls for a solid and for a rigorous science without premature conclusions. This is important. And it calls for transparency. And it calls also for an active approach from our side in the consortium in this project, where we engage different stakeholder groups. Um, and this is, well, this, this is what we're going to do. Uh, this is what we're aiming to do in, in the project. Um, let's see. I'm going to start sharing my screen also. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. And it's in presentation mode? Yes, it is in presentation mode now. Thank you. Yes. Yes, yes. Let's skip to the next slide. And uh, we, who are we in the consortium, uh, we are 18 partners from 11 different European countries, uh, distributed well across all over Europe, from north to south, to from east to west. Uh, we have, apart from all the different academic research institutes. We also have several companies. Uh, we have two associations and we also have a regulatory office in our consortium. So we represent a very wide range of disciplines and competences. The starting point for this project is to contribute to the EU policies on the circular bioeconomy and also to a zero pollution production in agriculture and in industry. We are going to work with microalgae and potato, these two organisms, microalgae and potato. Uh, the microalgae, you see up to in the left upper corner here, uh, the microalgae will deliver high value compounds uh, such as mycosporin like amino acids, whereas the residual biomass after extracting these compounds will be used as high quality poultry feed. Uh, the potato, in turn, uh, will be improved with virus resistance and uh, with an optimal starch quality for industrial processing. We are going to apply uh, gene editing as an intervention, as an intervention in these two systems, in microalgae and potato, uh, in order to improve the organisms and their products. Uh, coupled to this, we have a lot of different societal and technical objectives. Uh, focusing on these interventions with gene editing. Uh, so we will develop a publicly available toolbox for gene editing. Uh, we will use it, use this toolbox, to develop beneficial traits in the microalgae and potato. Um, and then we're going to look at regulatory innovation. Uh, we're going to check different regulatory alternatives and estimate or analyze, analyze their economic impact for various stakeholders, or for various purposes. Uh, together, this together with a study on acceptance levels of the corresponding products, or the, the resulting products. All of this will be embedded in a systems approach, uh, together with communication, with dissemination, exploitation, but also engagement of different stakeholders based on the principles of responsible research and innovation. Uh, you see uh, some examples of stakeholder groups here. We have risk assessors and decision makers, we have farmers, we have consumers, we have companies, etc. And uh, now, uh, for our project, this, the concept of responsible research and innovation, this translates into various uh, different things. 
So first of all, we have public, public engagement. This includes the involvement of citizens, of stakeholders, early on in the research and innovation processes. And that's what we're aiming to do. Science education. Uh, this is about creating awareness by explaining and educating uh, about the technology, about gene editing and the positive impact or the impact in general that they may have for, um, for different uh, aspects of, of uh, bioeconomy and for zero pollution uh, production. Uh, we have gender issues. Uh, we need to consider these to improve the perception, uh, but also consider the gender differences in in the process itself, in the research and innovation process. <clears throat> yeah, we have open science. We're going to ensure that scientific results from the product are open and available to all. Uh, ethics. We will ensure that the research and innovation is following scientific ethical integrity. And, of course, regulatory norms. But at the same time, also flag for pot potential, let's say, ethical issues or ethical gaps that may arise in the project. Uh, governance, finally, um, this aims towards, uh, let's say, predictability, proportionality, but also an inclusiveness uh, for a more engaging science to society relationship. Uh, now, um, there is a roadmap to implement a res uh, responsible research and innovation. And I will actually start by saying that, you know, you know innovations, um, they are by its nature disruptive. The innovation is about actually disrupting common practices and uh, in, but not in a negative sense, but it's about improving uh, common practices. So the real responsible research and innovation uh, recognizes that this, this science, the research innovation has this kind of transformative power. And what we need to reflect on is what, what kind of future uh, production processes, etc. Do we want this research and innovation to create? Uh, it's important to have this kind of reflection and in, in an inclusive way with different stakeholders. It needs to be inclusive, it needs to be reflect, uh, reflective, and it needs to be anticipatory. Uh, it may sound like a lot of buzzwords, but it's actually it's, it's, it's really important because it means that we should re reflect on the purpose of the research and innovation how to make best use of its potential and the pathways we take to get there. To help us reflect on these, uh, these pathways, let's say, and draw up the pathways, we will also implement a systems approach in our project. It means that we don't look at only the parts individually within a system, but we also look at the different relations and the feedback mechanisms between all these parts. So it, mean, it basically means that we are trying to understand the different perspectives that may affect the system in, in different ways. Yeah, so now, if we if, let's say if we intervene into a system of uh, let's say potato microbiology system, a value chain, uh, research and innovation, etc., it, the full impacts of these interventions are uh, are hard to predict. Uh, so we need this case-based monitoring of the systems, and this is where, exactly why we have our cases with potato and microalgae in our project. And you can also describe this approach as a way of uh, talking about issues and about system improvements, rather than uh, traditional thinking of problems and solutions. It's a kind of unidirectional, but uh, we, uh, we talk more about systems improvements. Yeah, in this way. So, uh, these are the two systems that we will start uh, mapping out, uh, the potato and the microalgae systems. So the idea is to uh, map out the systems and uh, try to in, uh, identify weak points, or weak, uh, or let's say issues in the systems, and then we analyze the consequences of the interventions, and then we aim for future for improvements to this system appropriate interventions with the technology will have a positive impact on the European Green Deal, on the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, etc. That's what we are aiming for. Now something about impact uh, again. So our project, uh, Gene Beacon, has different pathways to impact. 
Uh, you already mentioned this toolbox for gene editing. So uh, it's, it's among the, uh, some of the long-term impacts of our project is to uh, deliver different gene editing protocols that will be used, so hopefully used as standard in many research institutes across Europe, thereby having an impact on the research, uh, research process, research and innovation. Uh, the potato microalgae that we will develop in the, pro in, in the project uh, will hopefully benefit the research community and uh, commercial developers. Uh, so the long-term goal here is that several plant breeding companies, several microalgae companies and also poultry producers will work actively with the material that we will produce uh, in our project. This will lead uh, to, uh, given, given that we are working with virus systems, optimized start quality, and high value compounds for microalgae, uh, etc. So this will lead to less pesticides in agriculture, uh, less starch processing chemicals, less energy required for the production of this starch, and industrial quality starch I'm talking about for, for the potato, and a uh, resource efficient production of high value compounds together with repurposing of biomass, microalgae biomass, for and it's entering into a circular bioeconomy as the picture I showed you in the beginning. Now, one very important pathway to impact uh, is also our contributions to a regulatory framework in the EU that is fit for purpose to regulate gene-edited products or gene-edited derived uh, products. We will conduct several different analyses in our project, I repeat, without any premature conclusions. And once they are done, these analyses, uh, we will be ready to deliver input. Uh, for example, there is a very important process that the European Commission has initiated on regulatory oversight for plants derived from new genomic techniques. Our aim is to be able to, to deliver uh, input into this process. Now, to have real impact also, in the end, we also need to engage with the public and with different stakeholders. I have mentioned this before and it's uh, really a key aspect of our projects. Uh, also, our work is will contribute to uh, the research and innovation workforce in Europe uh, by, for example, training young researchers, as we are doing in our project. And this is very, very important to maintain European competitiveness in this field. Uh, I will uh, conclude now, actually, but I would, just, uh, I would like to give acknowledgement to the Cost Association also. Uh, apart from the Horizon Europe Framework Programme, I also want to, to acknowledge the Cost Association uh, because they have funded a cost action called Planted since 2019. Uh, I am the chair of this uh, cost action. We are running until next year also, next autumn. And this is a networking project uh, on plant genome editing. And uh, I would say the Gene Beacon project in Horizon Europe now, is a direct spin-off of the networking implanted. So it enabled us to build a consortium uh, for, for this project. Uh, so it's, uh, I think it's a nice and illustrative way where you can go from networking to research. So the, uh, the networking is important. Uh, I finish here um, and I will be happy to take questions. I don't know if you heard the clapping from the hall, but there was some. Do you have any questions, Mr. Eriksson? So maybe I have a question for you, because you mentioned the um, role of engagement of the public and stakeholders. So what exactly do you do? Or maybe not like exact example, but let's say, how do you want to achieve that? the public awareness, public engagement? By workshops, for example. So we're going to engage uh, stake stakeholder groups in uh, different workshops along the project, at various uh, phases of the project. We have, a, let's say, a starting out with some mapping, and then um, 
in, in the reflective way, as I talked about before, come back uh, to stakeholder groups along the different phases of the project. Right, thank you. Somebody else? Right, thank you very much, Mr. Eriksson. Thank um, you. And thank you for coming or joining us. <laughs> All right, our next speaker will be also, pardon, máme tu otázky. So I'll um, take advantage of this time that we have to spare to welcome the member of uh, European Parliament from Belgium, Tom van den Candelare, who just came. Welcome. Welcome to Prague. We are about to close our second sessions of today with another speaker online. The next minutes will belong to Irene Sacristian Sanchez, who is the head of uh, unit of, for biotechnology in the Directorate General Health and Food Safety of the European Commission. Welcome, Ms. Sanchez. Thank you. Good afternoon. Can you hear me properly? Yes, we can hear you nice and clearly. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And thank you to the Czech Presidency, the Czech Academy of Science, um, and you, Sash, for the invitation uh, this afternoon. So, I have prepared the presentation um, that was very much focused um, exclusively on the sustainability aspects of uh, the work we are doing in, in preparation of a possible legal proposal. Um, but after hearing the discussions this afternoon, and um, uh, there's been a lot of references to the work we are doing and a lot of uh, discussion in general about how uh, the legal framework should look like, um, I have decided to, to do a slightly different presentation. So. I don't know if the PowerPoint that I had sent uh, has been distributed to you. Don't be surprised. I'm going to present something slightly different to give you a bit of a broader overview of, of uh, where we are now in, in the process. Let me share my screen, otherwise I would forget. And, um, share. And now... Um, Okay? Yes, okay, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, there's been a lot of discussion this afternoon from the, the opening speeches and the keynote and through the two panels um, about the potential of, of uh, gene editing to contribute to uh, sustainability goals, food security, resilience uh, of our agriculture and, and so forth. And uh, this is very much at the origin of, of the work that we are now doing on, uh, on a possible legal proposal on new genomic techniques. Uh, from the very beginning of our work, um, this initiative had two distinct drivers. Uh, one was uh, the conclusions that we drew in the Commission study published uh, last year that uh, the GMO framework as it is today is not uh, appropriate for the products of uh, certain new genomic techniques. Uh, but the other is the potential of, of innovation and of biotechnology to, to contribute to some of the challenges that, that we face. And this was already the time when the farm to fork strategy was, uh, was published. And in the meantime, as many of you have said, a lot of things have happened uh, in the world to, to make uh, some of these challenges uh, even more pressing. At the time of the Commission study, um, you might recall, and some of you for sure contributed to this work, uh, that we did a mapping with the JRC about uh, the products in development and what was starting to come to, to market. And um, we found not only the strong interest in, in plant research, um, but also quite a wide diversity of crops and of trades um, being researched compared to what we are used to with, with the GMOs that we have authorized so far in the European Union. So we see a lot of trades um, that are linked to um, dealing with climate change, um, to resistance to pest and disease, to increasing yields, um, and so forth. And 
we are of course aware of, of the work of EU SASH and the database where you are collating uh, all the published literature which, which points to the same uh, results. And of course, we, we are building our work in, on the basis of, of this potential. Of course, it's, it's for you uh, plant scientists um, and for breeders uh, to actually deliver on this potential and on these uh, expectations. Um, but it's, it's our job um, in the Commission, in a first instance, to table legal proposals and ultimately of the Parliament and, and the Council to make sure that we have a regulatory framework um, that is fit for purpose. Um, and this is why we announced uh, that we would start a concrete initiative. Uh, when we published the study, at the same time, we announced an initiative on plants obtained by targeted mutagenesis and cisgenesis. And I underline this point because it's um, I think a slightly broader scope than what you're more specifically discussing um, in this conference on, on uh, gene editing. And obviously, as I've said, a key, a key driver is to try to put in place a legal framework that not only enables innovation, but actually steers innovation towards the kind of products that we want to see, that, that would meet uh, uh, economic, social, um, environmental uh, goals. Um, this is at the same time not the only objective of, of the initiative, and when it comes uh, to products like this, which in legal terms in the EU are GMOs from the moment of, of uh, the, the, the Court of Justice ruling of, of 2018. Uh, safety is a key issue and the safety of new techniques is a key issue as well because also as, as, uh, as we know and you know it better than I, um, I am not a scientist uh, myself by training, um, the new techniques can be used in very diverse ways and to do from limited to very extensive modifications. Um, uh, so it, one cannot say just uh, in a general statement that this is not an area where we need risk assessment and to ensure uh, safety. So safety remains a, a very prominent uh, a pillar of our initiative as well. And, uh, um, maintaining the principles of, of our food law and the, the precautionary principle is also key to many in our constituency, but also in the member states in the European Parliament as well. Uh, we are looking at a range of policy um, approaches on the main pillars uh, of, of um, the regulatory framework. I am not going to go into, into a lot of, um, of detail, but um, in case you're not aware, we've been putting quite a lot of materials in, in the last uh, couple of weeks on our website, including, for example, the targeted survey that we sent stakeholders, um, which some of you will have received, where we explain in some detail um, these policy approaches, which were already uh, very much underpinning the public consultation questions. There's been a lot of discussion today on, on aspects of risk assessment and authorization and uh, whether and when it's, it's necessary. Um, we are looking at different uh, possibilities that can also be, uh, be combined. We are always considering uh, maintaining the situation today, so maintaining what we call the baseline scenario is, uh, is uh, an option that we look at in the impact assessment. Um, but we are also looking at ways of tailoring risk assessment to risk, and EFSA is doing some work in, in that regard. Uh, we have mandated EFSA to look at, um, at criteria for risk assessment, but we have also been consulting on an option, um, which I think René Casters, for example, was referring to earlier, um, of not requiring risk assessment for products that can be considered uh, equivalent to conventional um, breeding. We are also looking very much at uh, whether and how to introduce uh, sustainability-related provisions in this initiative, either through regulatory incentives uh, or requirements. Um, of course, we are aware this is a legislation on the placing on the market of certain products. Uh, it, it's not the place to do a, an overall performance assessment of a variety or to do a holistic sustainability assessment of a product. Um, but we are considering whether to attach certain regulatory consequences 
um, depending on, on the traits and the potential of the trait to contribute to sustainability. We are looking, of course, at traceability and information provisions. Um, it has been said in some presentations before, and for us also, um, transparency in the chain uh, and for consumers is very important. Uh, we think it's, it's, it's a very uh, strong interest uh, among the European public and in general uh, in, in European uh, discussions, uh, but we are looking at, at how to how to approach with again with different uh, options in consideration. Uh, we have done a lot since we published this study. Um, uh, I know that uh, there are calls to go faster and to come earlier. Uh, we are going through a full impact assessment uh, process and through very extensive consultation uh, activities. So we've done. We've done a lot of things in the last um, in the last months, the public consultation, but quite a lot of targeted uh, consultation activities, uh, specifically with experts and, and stakeholders. We have asked EFSA and the JRC to do some uh, some technical work, in particular on the I mentioned earlier EFSA about uh, risk assessment. Um, the JRC is doing some case studies. Um, for us, looking at, at several concrete, real products in development um, uh, to look at, uh, at the potential impacts uh, in terms of sustainability objectives, um, which we think will be an, an important part of the impact assessment uh, to, um, uh, to assess and, and see how these uh, products could, uh, could contribute. And we have very intense stakeholder engagement also outside the formal activities. So a lot of events like this and meetings and, uh, and discussions. Um, we have quite a lot of interest in the, in the public consultation. Um, a lot of contributions from citizens um, and contributions from all the different stakeholder groups in, in, in this field, which are very varied. This is a very broad constituency, a lot of uh, different stakeholder groups interested in, in our initiative. Um, and actually, here you see more a breakdown of the economic operator category because it captures uh, a lot of different uh, stakeholders. Um, so we are uh, we are quite satisfied from the public consultation and the targeted consultation activities that uh, we think we we are hearing from the different voices and from the different positions, which is uh, which is very important in this debate, which is is a difficult one and and where there are uh, often very divergent uh, very divergent uh, views. Uh, let me tell you maybe a little bit just quickly what are the main issues that have been coming in coming up in consultation uh, activities. Um, uh, the issue of risk assessment is, I, I think, of course, a, a central one, and there um, uh, we've had, um, in particular, in the public consultation and in the targeted consultation activities. Um, we have a majority of respondents uh, who are calling for uh, for a new approach, uh, so to depart from the current uh, requirements, and we are getting a, a, a mix of responses in terms of um, an adapted risk assessment or to exclude from risk assessment certain products like those that would be obtained from conventional uh, breeding. And, as I said, uh, we are working with EFSA. We have asked EFSA to make some contributions on, on possible criteria to adapt risk assessment. And they are also updating their 2012 opinion on cisgenesis um, so that we have the latest uh, scientific advice uh, and we are not relying on, on, on opinions that, um, that are old. Uh, so uh, this will be, I think, a key, a key decision to take in, in the final um, proposal if the Commission decides uh, to come forward with a proposal after the impact assessment, um, uh, how to design the, the approach to, to risks uh, uh, for these products and possibly how to, how to approach it in a differentiated manner. Because I think, as I, as I was saying at the beginning, one. Uh, one of the things that are clear is that the techniques and their use are very diverse, so it's, it's not necessarily a one-size-fits-all um, uh, approach. 
Now, when it comes to sustainability, there's one thing I maybe want to mention first. Um, uh, I mean, this is an event today that brings together primarily uh, plant scientists, where we have heard a lot about uh, the strong potential of these technologies. There is discussion about this as well. We have uh, stakeholder groups who, who question that the enabling and fostering the use of, of biotechnology is the way to go for sustainability. Uh, so we have quite uh, different views in, in that regard um, to take into account. A key issue that, that we are looking at is, is uh, uh, as I said earlier, whether and how to include in this proposal um, specific provisions that would address sustainability goals. And uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, we are in the consultation activities, uh, we are getting um, a lot of comments, in particular for economic, from economic operator stakeholders, that uh, these issues should be uh, addressed um, rather in more horizontal level uh, legislation, uh, like the revision of the seeds legislation that is upcoming and, and that will uh, um, update and revise the, uh, the assessment of varieties uh, and, and so forth as well as the more horizontal framework for sustainable food systems, which is, is the flagship initiative of the Farm to Fork, which will come next year uh, as well. And of course, we are working closely uh, within the Commission to ensure coherence uh, amongst these initiatives, because they are all driven um, largely or partly by sustainability uh, objectives. At the same time, uh, we continue exploring uh, what to do in this particular initiative because um, we think it's, it's crucial um, that we come with a regulatory framework for NGTs which also clearly steers uh, towards certain products that bring, uh, that bring benefits. Um, uh, and actually, when we look at our consultation activities, um, a lot of the citizen responses, for example, do expect uh, that sustainability would be a, a strong uh, dimension when regulating uh, new genomic techniques. It's the view also of um, a few public authorities. Um, it's been the view from, uh, in our public consultation, for example, a majority of academic stakeholders as well. So that's something that we are looking at um, in detail. Um, and then finally, on issues on, on traceability and, and information, uh, there's quite a few different issues here. Um, uh, when it comes to, to traceability and also to the tools uh, for enforcement, of course, we, we are all aware that um, we need some adaptations to, uh, to the current legislation to make it, uh, to make it uh, workable and we need to think, uh, for example, how to ensure traceability in cases where there wouldn't be a laboratory method or there wouldn't be one, at least in the current state of, uh, of technical development. Um, but probably the, sort of the greatest debate uh, amongst uh, interested parties and, and citizens who are interested in, in this is, is on the issue of labeling. I think there is quite broad agreement. Uh, one of the points where, where most of our stakeholders are aligned is in, in the need for transparency, and we have heard that uh, today as well. Um, but the question is how to ensure it whether a physical labeling or whether other means. Um, and you have here, I don't know how visible, it's a bit blurry on my screen, I don't know how well you see this graph um, uh, where we have the different uh, responses uh, from labeling to databases or registries to QR codes and, uh, and so forth. But I think ensuring transparency along the chain uh, is, is important. It's, it's a, very important also for certain sectors uh, that uh, that do not use uh, GMOs, like the organic uh, sector, and that is generally also linked to, to the freedom of choice of consumers. So that uh, that will need to be ensured. Uh, and the question is, what is the best uh, the best means? I don't want to go on uh, because we are almost uh, reaching the the, the closing. Um, 
but uh, just to say we maintain our plan uh, we need to we are very advanced in the impact assessment uh, with the idea of completing it end of this year beginning of next uh, so that then on the basis of uh, of the impact assessment uh, the commission can take the political decision on on the way forward with a view to a possible legal proposal um, in the second quarter of, of last year or last year no next year uh, last year is what you were asking for but uh, next year <laughs> is when the proposal eventually will uh, will come and i'll stop here but i'm i'm very happy to take questions if if there's time for it thank you thank you are there any questions yes So, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Sanchez. I'm very happy uh, to join us uh, in Prague in this remote way. I would like to thank you also for your job. I, I understand it's not easy because we know that in the Agri Committee you face uh, to the pressure because we as members, we ask you to accelerate the work on the new legislative and to allow uh, NGTs and uh, you mentioned very well uh, that the, the biggest issue uh, in the beginning of your speech, you said the biggest issue is uh, safe, uh, it's safety. Uh, safety, I think it's very good priority, but uh, from the point of view that we import to the Europe million tons of G GMO um, crops, I don't understand where is safety. I would like to have answer to, to the citizens. If our priority is safety, I agree, absolutely agree. But where is the safety if we import so huge uh, immense uh, uh, products, GMO, to the EU and we use it? And we, uh, we, we have consumption on this. So uh, it's a, my first question, because we should answer on this. And my second question is, you said that the key, uh, the, 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 the key, uh, the key uh, issue is, uh, excuse me, um, key issue is sustainability, of course. Uh, we, <clears throat> we have heard here that sustainability, that for the sustainability of the production, NGTs, uh, there is the solution. Um, my question is, where is uh, uh, between the issue, the principle of uh, equality, uh, competitiveness on the market? Because I see that our farmers, uh, I don't mention our researchers, uh, have diff different position as uh, the farmers, producers abroad. I think that we breach those principles. So we should act. It's not a question if we will have a uh, new legislature. We should, we should really to, do, to, to repair our position on the world market. So thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, that you are, uh, that you are, I hope, uh, in favor this, uh, uh, this new legislation. Thank you very much. Which question would you like to start with? I can, I can try both. Um, so first, about the, um, the GMOs we, we import have all been authorized in the EU, so they have been assessed, uh, and EFSA has uh, concluded that they are as safe as their conventional counterparts. So um, I, I'm not trying to say that GMOs are, as a whole, safe or unsafe. Uh, GMOs are because of their specificity, they are subject to risk assessment, like other products, and they are not the only regulated product in, in the EU, um, but once they are, uh, they are assessed, they, 
if they are found to be safe, we proceed with the authorization. We are responsible for the authorizations in, in my unit, and when we have an, an EPSA positive opinion, uh, we proceed. Uh, so um, uh, I hope that, that clarifies what, what I was trying to, uh, to make. Um, in terms of uh, the issue of uh, the competitiveness and the, the need to, to uh, act, I mean, I think the, the Commission drew a, a clear uh, conclusion when publishing the, the study, and on the day we published the study, uh, the transmission letter um, to the Portuguese presidency at the time, if I remember well, uh, the Commission indicated we would start a policy initiative to look into the regulation of, of uh, plants obtained through certain new uh, techniques. So in that uh, respect, we felt uh, we need to look in, into the matter. Competitiveness, trade aspects, uh, they are of course a part of the equation and they are an important one. Alongside with all the others, I mean, this, this is an area where uh, there are a lot of, of issues and a lot of, uh, of different uh, views and uh, we need to act on the basis of, of a solid uh, assessment and this is why we are taking the time to do the impact assessment to decide what's, uh, what's the course of action uh, that we think is more appropriate. Uh, and then ultimately, of course, it will be in the hands of the European Parliament and, and the member states to decide where the EU should land. Uh, but, uh, but certainly uh, the competitiveness uh, aspect, uh, but also very, very importantly, giving tools uh, to our farmers uh, are, are central aspects in, in this discussion. But so is the safety, and so is the freedom of choice, and, and all the other things that are part of, of, uh, of this complicated debate. Thank you. Other questions? If not, we thank you once more, Ms. Sanchez. Thank you for joining us, and have a nice evening. Thank you very much. So, today's official program is slowly coming to its end and let me invite here for the closing remarks David Honis, a member of the Academic Council of the Czech Academy of Sciences and a plant genetist and also one of the organizers of this conference. Thank you very much. So, dear members of the European Parliament, dear President Zajimalová, dear Professor Inze, ladies and gentlemen, Thank you, and please let me say a few words at the end of this wonderful session. So the conference or genome editing for food safety and crop improvement is basically or almost in the half. And I would like to stress the word almost and soon you will learn why. And the conference has been, or, or sorry, I said has been, but it's a little bit preliminary, still is being organized by the Czech Academy of Sciences and also by EUSAGE with cooperation with the Ministry of Agriculture of the Czech Republic and also by the Institute of Experimental Botany of the Czech Academy of Sciences. And since our objective, and now I think I can say has been, uh, to bring together the scientists and stakeholders and also the experts in many fields together with the policymakers, and I believe that this uh, goal has been achieved so i would like to thank all the organizers for doing a great job and since i'm also discussing with people during for example during the coffee break or whenever around the hotel about how they like the conference and people seem to be happy so this is particularly because of the local organizers and then i'm afraid i have to read it because i never remember the names of the of our division so with the division of international cooperation and the external relations division of the czech academy of sciences and i would like to specially thank our wonderful moderator eliška zvolankova for great way how she is guiding us through this afternoon thank you But that's not it. She was not the only person speaking here today. We had two sessions and we have a number of great speakers. So I would also like to thank all the speakers for the great talks they were giving today. Thank you.
In these two sessions, we learned many things. The first one was a little bit scientific, and so we learned what actually are the novel genomic techniques, gene editing or CRISPR-Cas, if you like, what is it good for, how it works, and we also learned how we, it can help the agriculture. And in the second session, we also learned that for the sustainability of European agriculture, it's important to get involved these stakeholders and to act together and to work on basically all the aspects that we want to target, which is not only the food safety, but also the, and not only the yield of the agriculture products, but the quality of the products, the resilience of the plants towards different diseases and many other aspects. And I think that so far, at least it was my impression from today that everything looks bright and orange, that everything looks perfect and we can look at a bright future. And the trouble I think will come tomorrow because since our objective or one of the objectives of this, uh, of this meeting, of this conference is to exclude the gene editing or novel genomic techniques from the uh, regulation of G as a, being treated as GMO by European Commission, that is not as easy as we think because we know that there are many people who don't like this technology. And it's our all groups of people from, for example, people just fearing the unknown, unknown, basically novel stuff, or also much more organized and much more targeted groups of people with specific interests. And if I can characterize the tomorrow session by one keyword, that keyword will be communication. I think most of the talks will be dealing with this issue. So I think it will be much more challenging and let's keep my fingers crossed to the speakers for tomorrow to take this task successfully. So thank you. And before I end, I'd like to have three announcements. One I've already almost said, so we start here tomorrow at 9 a.m. One announcement. The second has been said here already twice and it was the invitation for the brainstorming that was done already by Oana Dema and Dirk Inze that to, for tomorrow people who are interested and everyone is welcome are welcome to meet here after the lunch when the conference is officially ended to help to set up the criteria for the definitions of cisgenomics and targeted mutagenesis products that can be obtained conventionally. So to help the politicians to deal with this difficult task. So it will be tomorrow after the lunch. And last, I think it's time for relax and also time to explain the word almost. So we will hopefully relax and enjoy a bit of a social dinner that is prepared for us uh, now in this evening. And this dinner is going to happen in wonderful villa of uh, Moritz Gröbe. And I'm mentioning his name because he can be considered as kind of symptomatic for the time when this villa was built. The villa is exactly 150 years old this year. It's being built in, at the edge of Vinohrady in the, I, I must say, beautiful Italian Tuscany style. It's really a wonderful place. And why I'm mentioning Moritz Grabe because he used to be, and now let's to say it properly, German speaking Jewish entrepreneur living in Prague. And that's why I said it's symptomatic from Prague of the late 19th century. So please enjoy the dinner and I think Eliska will tell you the details about how to get there and so on. So exactly. thank you. <laughs> thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for your attention. I will take some more minutes to add some uh, really needed information. But first, let me um, let me greet another person who just came here. It's the member of the European Parliament from Italy, Herbert Dorfmann. Welcome. <laughs> As we already welcomed uh, Tom van den Candelare, also, Herbert Dorfmann, they both will talk tomorrow, so you will have the chance to meet them. So now the organization information. As you heard, you are very warmly welcome to join the reception in the Villa, uh, Grebeho Villa. We call it in the shortcut Grebovka. Maybe it is easier for you to remember, I don't know. But you have definitely very much uh, to look forward to. Um, 
you can use the shuttle buses to get there. They will park in front of the hotel, in front of the main entrance on the, on this, no, 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 this is the wrong side. Sorry, I'm a little bit confused, but it's the main entrance, it's the entrance towards the square, the Senovážné náměstí. Okay, so the buses leaves, so the buses leave at 18.15, 18.30 and 80.45, that means each 15 minutes from now, kind of, I guess. Perfect. The reception itself starts at 7 p.m. Um, please pick up your belongings right at the registration table. They are prepared there for you, so your codes and everything that you left possibly at the lunch, so you will find it just down here at the registration. I hope to uh, see most of you at the Grebovka, and I will look forward to seeing you tomorrow also in the morning here in the hotel. Andas, have a delightful evening.